The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding will start shortly.
Order, order. Order, order. Uh, Catherine McKinnell to move the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr Dowd, and it's an honour to serve under your chairmanship today. And I beg to move that this House has considered e-petition 609530, which calls on the government to waive visa requirements for Ukrainian refugees. And I thank Philip Jolliffe, who I believe is here today, who, for bringing this petition to the House and to the over 240,000 petitioners who have signed it and related petitions since it was tabled just over a week ago. On the 24th of February, the day that Russia invaded Ukraine, the Prime Minister said this, I say to Ukrainians in this moment of agony, we are with you, we are praying for you and your families, and we are on your side. And many of us believe that being on Ukraine's side must mean, at the very least, allowing Ukrainians fleeing Russia's bombs and tanks to come to the UK for sanctuary. But the shameful reality is that we have put up barriers every step of the way. And we have turned away desperate, frightened people in their greatest hour of need. And we should have been prepared for this. We've known Russian troops were massing at the Ukrainian border for months. And with his record of atrocities in Chechnya, Georgia, Syria, and Ukraine itself, we had no illusions as to what President Putin is capable of. Indeed, on the 20th of February, the Prime Minister told the BBC, the plan that we are seeing is for something that could be really the biggest war in Europe since 1945. The next day, the US ambassador to the United Nations said, we will see a devastating loss of life, unimaginable suffering. Millions of displaced people will create a refugee crisis across Europe. Just three days later, the Russian invasion began, and so did the long predicted refugee crisis. According to the UN, around 2.8 million refugees have already fled Ukraine. And as President Putin's hope of a quick victory have evaporated in the, face of, in the face of fierce Ukrainian resistance, the fighting has only intensified. And however bad the conflict looks from the comfort of our televisions and computer screens, humanitarian workers and journalists have been very clear that it is 10 times worse on the ground. Families are struggling to seek safety. Hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands have been left without food, water, electricity, no access to medical care. Elderly people have been left trapped, unable to move. Last week, we will have all have seen the horrible images of the maternity and children's ward in the city of Mariupol being destroyed in a Russian airstrike, reports of children buried under rubble, authorities digging a mass grave because the morgues were overflowing. Ukrainians have prepared to escape through humanitarian corridors, but have had to turn back because Russian forces have continued their assault. Which one of us would not want to flee such a nightmare? And we know Poland has already welcomed around 1.2 million people fleeing that hell across the border. Moldova have accepted 83,000 Ukrainians, 3% of its own population. Whilst most refugees will no doubt want to remain in countries close to Ukraine, some are travelling further afield to Western Europe. Faced with the continent's worst humanitarian crisis in living memory, the EU swiftly announced and introduced an emergency plan, the Temporary Protection Directive, to allow Ukrainians to live and work in the bloc for three years. And as of Tuesday, around 10,000 Ukrainians had arrived in France, 30,000 in Italy. In Germany, which is closer to Ukraine, has over 120,000. The EU Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, said, all those fleeing Putin's bombs are welcome in Europe. It was a warm, open-hearted message that so many Ukrainians desperately needed to hear. The UK is, of course, no longer part of the EU and has its own approach based around two significantly less generous schemes. The first, I will give way. 
I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and I'm sorry to interrupt her because she's making a passionate and well-informed speech. I wanted to briefly mention a constituent of mine who has a friend from Ukraine who fled to Calais with her seven-year-old son, but they were turned away and told they needed appointments at a UK visa centre. She finally managed to get herself an appointment in Brussels on the 24th of March. However, she was told that her son would not be allowed into the visa centre without an appointment of his own, even though he's seven years old and there was no availability until the following week. So I wanted to ask my honourable friend, does she agree it's unacceptable to stop parents bringing their children into visa centres, and will she urge the minister, as she speaks, to take action to ensure that dependents can share these appointments and provide clarity to refugees about the necessity of these appointments, now that the UK government has finally said those with Ukrainian passports can apply fully online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thank my honourable friend for that intervention and I would go further than it being unacceptable. It's completely heartbreaking to hear these stories and to see the way many of these families and uh, people in the, the most desperate, desperate of situations have been treated and, and we've seen images um, that have been heartbreaking to watch. So I will um, more than happily uh, put that question to the Minister and expect to hear um, a response uh, when he replies. I mean, going back to this, the um, processes that are available, the first is a Ukraine Family Scheme visa, which allows Ukrainians with select family members in the UK to remain for three years, assuming that they can get here. Okay. I thank her very much for giving way. I've just come off the phone to my caseworker because just today we've been contacted by a constituent of mine whose father in his 70s uh, has managed to flee Ukraine over the Polish border, actually went to a UK visa centre and has successfully passed all his checks, been granted a visa, but now been told he's got to travel 300 kilometres to Warsaw yep. to pick it up. Yep. He's in his 70s, he's got two... Uh, two bags of belongings he's not in a position to do that does she agree with me that that's just beyond ridiculous and they just need to be people need to be issued with the visas on site if we're not going to waive the visa requirement yes I, I absolutely agree and I think that the point is very well made and I have no doubt that every member contributing today will have these stories from our constituents and the family members of our constituents who they are desperately trying to help and who come to their MP for help, but actually there are so many people that don't have that support available, and that's who my heart breaks for, that um, people who are uh, encountering these challenges um, and, and don't know where to turn for help. But, so, speaking to the Home Affairs Select Committee last week, the Ukrainian ambassador himself seemed genuinely surprised to hear that the current scheme only applies if a relative has settled status, and that this hadn't been extended to all Ukrainians living here legally. So I know the Home Secretary said on Thursday that she's looking at broadening that eligibility to include Ukrainians on time-limited work or study visas. So I'm really hoping the Minister can give some reassurances and further detail on that today to put minds at rest, that at least that hurdle has been addressed by the government. The second route, the Homes for... Um, I'll happily give way to the Minister. If I'd be helpful and say it's just been announced in the chamber, I appreciate that she wouldn't have heard the statement before coming in, that it's those with limited immigration leave will also be act as sponsor, provided they've got six months leave to be here in, here in the UK, given the six-month minimum of providing housing. OK. Um, the second route, the Homes for Ukraine programme, which I know has been announced in the chamber today, and I understand although I'm happy to be corrected because we have only just received the details, allows charities and individuals to sponsor Ukrainians to come here, even where there are no family ties, and stay with members of the public for at least six months and remain in the UK for three years. My understanding is people will be paid £350 a month during the sponsorship and local authorities will receive around £10,000 for refugees using this route. In practice, this scheme is likely to be extended mainly to Ukrainians already known to people in the UK. Members will be aware that there is a statement on this matter currently ongoing in the main chamber. We will need to look at the details more fully. But what we do know is that 
These initiatives are still quite limited. They cover only selected people, lucky enough to have family members here or to be chosen for sponsorship. They do not offer all Ukrainians fleeing violence the opportunity to come to our country as refugees. And it should come as no surprise then that in stark contrast to many of our European allies, the UK had issued just 4,000 visas as of Sunday afternoon, according to the Home Office. The Home Secretary repeatedly raises security as a justification for the government's approach. And security is by no means a trivial issue. But it's difficult to see what security has to do with the government's decision to mostly restrict access to selected family members of people settled in the UK. People arrive in the UK with all kinds of challenges and we deal with them. But aren't the hugely restrictive schemes just a policy choice the government has made for whatever reason rather than in response to a specific security threat? And if security concerns are what underpins the government's approach, how does that fit with the levelling up secretary's suggestion that the public could find people to sponsor on social media? Is that really the safest way to go about this, if security is the main concern? It's telling that Germany, France and Spain, who no doubt share concerns about security within their borders, have not used that same rationale. And I'm afraid to say it looks like the government is searching for reasons for this highly limited and restrictive approach which it has taken throughout this crisis. The Minister may give a response that explains and clarifies this for members today, but I think the public are certainly struggling to understand. But even the distinctly ungenerous design of these two schemes has been surpassed by the chaos and the confusion over how desperate Ukrainians are supposed to even access them, which has seen government ministers at times openly contradicting each other. The list of requirements that Ukrainians have um, been faced with is, quite frankly, dizzying. First, they must create an online account on the Home Office website and fill in a detailed application form in English. Then they must upload proof that their family member has residence in the UK. They must prove that they were living in the UK prior to January the 1st, 2022. Evidence must then be provided of the link to the family member in the UK. And if they don't have this, they need to provide an explanation why. And if that documentation then needs to be translated from Ukrainian or Russian into English, the applicant is responsible for ensuring this happens. And before tomorrow's changes, even those with full documentation had to book and attend appointments to give biometrics, including fingerprints, in person at UK visa application centres. Those without passports will still have to and as Ukraine's ambassador told the Home Affairs Select Committee last week, most people do not have their passports with them. Mm -hmm. Their homes were burned. Mm -hmm. Many who braved the journey to Calais found only a handful of Home Office officials handing out crisps and chocolate bars before telling them that no visas would be issued there. Ukrainians were advised in, um, to call a UK number or visit a website and travel elsewhere. Not the easiest thing to do when you have just arrived from a war zone. Disturbing news reports showed children bursting into tears after hours of queuing outside UK visa application centres in sub-zero temperatures. Many constituents that have contacted me have come to their own view on this, that the bureaucratic complexity and apparent ind indifference to the suffering of Ukrainian refugees is entirely consistent with the government's overarching migration and asylum policy, where anyone hoping to enter the UK is met with assistance uh, a system that is grudging, inefficient, and designed to keep them out, no matter what the costs on the other side yeah. of the ledger. Yeah. One constituent contacted me seeking support to bring his family to the UK. After many anxious hours and days, his family messaged to progress. They, ma they managed to progress the case. But he sent me a message saying, I'm ashamed at the way this current government is treating Ukrainian refugees. And whilst they've eventually managed to obtain support, there will be many that do not have that ability to receive that help. Another constituent added, I weep when I see elderly people queuing in sub-zero temperatures outside well-heated offices, which they've had to travel extra distance to after their exhausting flight from bombs and war. With a further stating, I'm hugely disappointed by our government's slowness to provide a safe haven for Ukrainian people. 
Others have described the response as woeful, inhumane and overly bureaucratic. Chair, too many times in the last few years, whether Syria, Afghanistan or government has been too slow and too bureaucratic Ukrainian. to respond in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Ukrainians are just the latest victims and the Home Office must now urgently coordinate the systems and the staff necessary to run a humane and efficient admissions process. One that recognises people fleeing a war zone aren't necessarily going to have all their papers in order. That's right. That's right. So I want to, before I conclude, Chair, ask the Minister some specific questions. First, there is no doubt that the scale of the crisis is immense, with over 2.8 million already fleeing Ukraine and millions more to come. It's a disaster on a scale our continent has not seen since the mid-20th century, and it's a huge challenge for the UK and its allies to deal with. But it was also predictable. The government has had intelligence that a Russian invasion of Ukraine was likely for some time. Presumably, ministers also received advice on the unimaginable scale of the refugee crisis and the options available to help manage it. And yet, clearly, a decision was taken to help only a very small number of Ukrainians reach the UK. When the Minister responds, can he explain how and why the government arrived at this decision and why, when we have known that this might happen for some time, the humanitarian sponsorship route has only been revealed today? Second, the economic fallout of this war will not be confined to Russia and Ukraine. For us here in the UK, we already know that the sanctions imposed on Russian oil exports, for example, will heighten pre-existing pressures on household finances. But humanitarian agencies have warned that the devastating effects will be felt especially by the world's poorest. For example, in Lebanon, a reliance on imports from Ukraine and Russia has led to acute shortages in wheat and grain and cooking oil and skyrocketing food and fuel prices. So can the minister confirm that the government will respond from now on with the long-term vision that this requires and that we will provide the support here but ensure that that does not take away from the budgets that we're already committing to helping humanitarian, the humanitarian consequences of this crisis elsewhere. There are some Ukrainians already in the UK, such as students who are sponsored by a university who are coming to the end of their course, whose leave to remain will come to an end soon. And quite understandably, many of them will not be able to return to Ukraine. So, but instead of granting concessions, as they have done with HGV drivers or port butchers and seasonal workers, the, current, the Home Office policy appears to be currently be to make every single individual contact the Home Office separately. And the risk here that they'll be forced to make human rights or asylum applications, which will add a further administrative burden on the system. My constituency office is already still working to support people that arrived from conflict zones four or five years ago. Some as unaccompanied children, they're still waiting for decisions on their cases. So it makes no sense that we're forcing Ukrainians legally present here in the UK to compete with Syrians and Afghans for the attention of the overstretched Home Office officials. So will the government look at a way to automate this process for Ukrainians already in the UK? And as I understand it, same-sex marriage is not recognised in Ukraine, and LGBT people might find it harder to prove their relationships with sponsors and their families. So what is the government doing to ensure LGBT relatives and partners can get out of Ukraine safely without facing discriminatory barriers? On the sponsorship route, how many refugees does the government anticipate will come via this route, given that it's likely to be restricted mostly to those who are already known to people in the UK? Can the minister confirm which families will have access to universal credit once the sponsorship ends? And how will we deal with the obvious safeguarding concerns of placing vulnerable people who we know will be mostly women and children? Mm. The Home Affairs Select Committee heard evidence that some staff working at TLS Contact are taking what would be seen as an opportunistic approach to people attending visa application centres, recommending to vulnerable groups that they pay an extra amount of money to get an early appointment. Is the government aware about this commercial predatory approach that's being applied in a humanitarian disaster? And are they taking steps to do something about it? 
The Home Secretary warned, was warned by the Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration in November that customers at visa application centres often felt forced to pay due to a lack of free appointments and difficulties uploading documents, for example. And what action has been taken in response to this warning? And can he also confirm that the Home Office is not offering its own paid service to expedite applications? The Prime Minister has said... The UK is way out in front in our willingness to help. Well, willingness is one thing, but I would hate to think what, willingness, um, what unwillingness might look like when we have a Home Secretary that has gone so far as to imply that the Irish government's welcoming policy has put the UK security at risk. This petition calls on the government to join the EU in waiving visa requirements for Ukrainian passport holders arriving in the UK and everything we have seen so far suggests that government intends to respond by mainly tweaking existing managed migration routes. But this crisis isn't going away anytime soon. It's only going to get worse as President Putin targets more and more Ukrainian cities in his destructive war on civilians. Future waves of refugees are likely to be even more vulnerable as those with fewer resources and connections will be the last ones to escape. The petition's creator, Philip Jolliffe, contacted me um, in advance of this debate today and said, I've been lucky to work with several Ukrainian engineers over the years. I've been in contact with some and I fear the safety of others. I've heard back from one friend. He's already volunteered and deployed with his unit. It's hard for me to fathom the idea of men I worked with having to pick up arms and wave goodbye to their children. Last I heard, his wife and child remained in Kyiv. I feel great shame and frustration that they cannot come to the UK and receive shelter and aid. It is here waiting for them. The response to the Ukrainian invasion across Europe, even in some countries that have generally been quite hostile to refugees, has only served to highlight the UK's shameful policy and it's time for the government to change course. If 27 European countries can do their bit, so should we. The public response to this crisis and this petition, which surpassed over 100,000 signatures and the threshold for this debate in such a short space of time have shown that the British public have big hearts and open arms. They clearly don't want us to be offering a half-hearted begrudging support to fleeing Ukrainians with painfully difficult conditions attached. The government doesn't have to allow unlimited numbers of people to stay in the UK indefinitely, but it must treat this for what it is, a humanitarian crisis. The country has offered sanctuary to those fleeing war on the European continent in generations past. Ukrainians that came here after the Second World War have become an integral part of many local communities up and down the country, and many are doing what they can to help their fellow Ukrainians in this moment of unprecedented crisis. And as we look to be entering a new era in world politics, exemplified by President Zelensky's historic address to this House, it's time for us, genuinely, and open-heartedly to offer that sanctuary again. Thank you. <clears throat> the question is that this House has considered e-petition 609530 relating to arrangements for the Ukrainian refugees to enter uh, the United Kingdom. R Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I'd like to... Um, extend my thanks to the Honourable Member for Newcastle-upon-Tyne North for tabling this petition debate. The response of the British people has been overwhelming and they have shown extraordinary generosity and that stands in very stark contrast to the response of this government. I can genuinely say that this is one of these times where I feel incredibly proud of our country mm. but I feel ashamed of this government. The response has been shambolic and shameful and I wish to outline some examples of my constituents and their families to highlight how the absurd and crushing misery of Home Office bureaucracy has impacted on people fleeing Ukraine. One of my constituents has a 74-year-old mother. She is frail and in poor health. She's escaped Russian invasion for the second time. She applied for a UK visa on the 5th of March. She was in Krakow. She was told to travel to Jashov to get her biometrics. On the 7th of March, this 74-year-old woman, frail and in poor health, queued for seven hours 
in the freezing cold just to get to her appointment. She was then told she would receive confirmation within 72 hours, but she was told she had to travel back to Warsaw, where she would then get her passport stamped and she could make her way with her daughter to the UK. It is now one week on, and her daughter, my constituent, is stuck in a hotel whilst they wait for the email. I raised this with the urgent inquiries line at the Home Office, but have had no reply. My caseworker this morning went to talk to the uh, caseworker desk in Portcullis House, and they said, oh yes, it's been approved, it was approved last Thursday, but we haven't told her yet. What? We'll take this. We then rang my constituent and her mother. They'd turned up to the embassy anyway on the off chance. They'd been told, they had just been told within the, within the same 10 minutes that it had been approved, but the embassy wasn't sure if it, were, if it could print out the sticker today. And if it can't print out the sticker today, then they'll have to come back tomorrow. This woman is traumatized. She is exhausted. And her daughter is spending money on food and hotels and flights that they simply can't afford. To summarize, a 70-year-old woman mm. applying to come to the UK has been asked to travel 855 miles over the course of nine days, and she's waiting for a sticker to be printed. Mm. So will the minister apologize to her and to everybody else like her who has been put through such an awful situation. Another constituent and his family, well, they've been lucky because actually they have now gone through the process and they're now in a position where they can book their flights to come here. But they wrote to me last night and asked if I could share with the minister the stark contrast between the support they received in Poland and the bureaucratic nightmare of being processed by the UK authorities. In Poland, they told me, Checks at the border take a matter of minutes. We were made to feel welcomed and safe. They said the UK's process had been a nightmare. They fled Kyiv for Poland on the 5th of March. On the 9th of March, they finally managed to get their biometrics done in Warsaw after completing forms which took hours on a mobile phone. Two days later, on the 11th of March, they got an email saying their decisions were ready but the Home Office wouldn't tell them what the decision actually was. So the next day, they had to go back to the Visa Application Centre, and there, their passports were stamped. But one person's, the mother-in-law's visa, was stamped, but her partner's was not. They were told there just isn't enough time today to get it printed. Oh, make the time. Come back tomorrow. Make the time. Finally, all the paperwork is in place. They have managed to book flights to come back tomorrow but it has taken them 10 days. The constituent sister wrote this to me, and I quote, they were already exhausted and traumatized when they arrived in Warsaw. British bureaucracy added to their uh, misery. Their very modest savings have been seriously depleted by the eight day hotel stay. At least my family had my brother, a British citizen, to help them navigate the red tape. It must be doubly difficult for those who don't have that advantage and who don't speak good English. The government must do much, much more and quickly turn this convoluted system into something that is user-friendly for Ukrainians. I have other constituents on top of this, and many of them have said to me that they're confused. They're confused about whether they need to now attend appointments, which they've secured in the coming weeks, given the rule changes to, that apparently are coming into uh, place tomorrow, that biometrics can be done in the UK. They have asked the visa application centres, whether they still have to go to these appointments, and they haven't got an answer. I've asked the Home Office MP hotline, and I haven't had an answer. And my caseworker case went to the casework hub earlier at 20 minutes to four, just over an hour ago, and they still didn't have an answer. So can the minister give us an answer to that question today? It is time. It is abundantly clear from these examples that it is now time to waive the visa requirement before people come here. Mm -hmm. It is cruel to impose these layers of bureaucracy on traumatized refugees who are trying to escape war and join their families. 
I have got dozens of constituents, like so other uh, many members, who are willing to offer spare rooms, mm -hmm. in lucky cases, spare homes, to Ukrainian families. I have one constituent who is the owner of a hotel chain. He says that he can offer work and accommodation mm -hmm. to Ukrainian refugees immediately, but he cannot get hold of any information on how to do it. Refugee Action has indicated that there are experienced refugee and asylum charities who have, have a wealth of experience and they say that they have not been consulted by the Home Secretary. Why not? So, Mr Chair, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak this afternoon. It is abundantly clear from examples of my constituents and constituents of many other members that this Home Office bureaucracy is causing untold misery on top of the existing misery of those who are fleeing war. Please, can the Home Office just sort this out? Janice Tarby. Janice Tarby. Thank you, Mr. Child, and it's a pleasure to serve under you as Chair this afternoon. I want to use this opportunity to put on record the experiences of my constituents in Lewisham East and to press the government to act and to listen. There are 530 Ukrainians living in Lewisham and many have family and friends in Ukraine. They've told me what they're going through and how the Ukrainian family scheme is full of bureaucratic obstacles. There is no visa application centres currently operating in Ukraine and those operating in other European countries are overwhelmed with the workload as we've already heard. My constituent's mother-in-law is in the middle of a two-week wait for the next available appointment at the nearest visa application centre in Poland. The situation in other visa application centres throughout Europe is no better, and there are reports of up to two to three weeks waiting times, and everywhere this sounds like it is quite ridiculous, very painful, and very traumatising for Ukrainian people. Another constituent has told me that their friend's daughter who began her application ten days ago is still trapped in Poland due to the Home Office. Bureaucratic red tape and delays to processing her visa. This is simply not good enough. Recent government announcement, announcements on biometric data collection are welcome, but the Home Office should have done this weeks ago. Furthermore, these changes still won't tackle all the long delays that families are facing and won't include many of the people fleeing the invasion. The government often quotes scripture, so I will too. In Matthew 25, verses 35 to 40, it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Now, these words struck with me, because this is what the Home Office needs to be doing for Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. Yet, instead, they are making it too hard for refugees to come to our country. They're making it difficult for refugees to receive this food, to receive drink and warmth. And I hope this is the result of incompetence rather than a desire to create a hostile environment for refugees, although I fear it may be both. I will end with this by asking the Home Office to commit to introducing emergency protection visas for those fleeing Ukraine who want to reach the UK. under your chairmanship and uh, a pleasure to get to um, address this petition, although it's really quite disgraceful that we should find ourselves uh, now several weeks on from the start of the war still in a position where the United Kingdom, for reason, United Kingdom government, for reasons which escape me, is unable to emulate the generosity of our European Union neighbours. Uh, Mr Dowd, hundreds of my constituents in Edinburgh South West have signed this petition and rarely have I received so many emails on a topic as I've received on the issue of what the UK government should be doing to help uh, Ukrainian refugees. And like other honourable members, many of my constituents have made practical suggestions. And I know we have this uh, sponsorship scheme update that was announced in the chamber this afternoon, and I managed to be there uh, for the statement. But uh, it seems to me that it, it does nothing to address the urgency of the situation. And I think what my constituents know, but what the UK government doesn't seem to uh, realise, is that we have a moral obligation to help these people. 
But we also have legal obligations under the Refugee Convention. And this government are in the midst of passing a, a bill at present which breaches those obligations. And I think this huge crisis on our doorstep in Europe, the biggest crisis in Europe since the Second World War, surely it should be the signal that the UK government need uh, to revisit their policy on uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Now, last week when I spoke in the Chamber on the International Women's Day debate, I emphasised the plight of women in Ukraine and their children. And of course, women are particularly vulnerable in wartime because of the risk of sex-based violence. And sadly, we know that at least some of the Russian forces on the ground are committing war crimes in Ukraine as we speak. So the imperative to send a signal that there is a safe route for these people to come, for these women and their children to come to the United Kingdom is uh, very, very strong. And we know from the United Nations that the majority of the now millions of refugees fleeing the country are women and children. And put bluntly, what these people need to know now is that they can have visa-free access to the United Kingdom with their children. And we must match the European Union on this. No ifs and no buts, and we really just need to get on with it. Now, the very helpful House of Commons Library briefing for this debate tells us that it would be perfectly possible for security and biometric checks to be, taken, to be undertaken if Ukrainians had the same visa-free access as they have elsewhere in Europe after they've actually uh, got here. And as I've said already, our European allies can afford visa-free refuge safely and securely. So why can't the Home Office... On TV, we've seen queues of upset and exhausted people, old people, small children, as other honourable members have said, waiting in freezing conditions outside British visa, uh, uh, visa application centres. And I've heard from Scots trying to assist people that desperate families have been thrown out of visa centres so staff could close for lunch after waiting for hours. Now, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be almost comic. It's ludicrous. The Home Office needs to get its act together. This is not rocket science. Other countries, considerably less wealth con wealthy countries than uh, the United Kingdom's Union of Nations, are managing to do a better job than us. So the government really needs to up uh, their game. Now, as other honourable members have said, um, what the other European countries have been able to do is to uh, offer um, visa-free access. And they've done this by adopting a decision to implement the European Union's Temporary Protection Directive with immediate effect. And that directive establishes minimum EU-wide standards for protection for people displaced by the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. And these include rights of access to suitable accommodation, medical care, social welfare payments, and to employment. And the temporary protection uh, can be granted for one year, but can uh, go up to a maximum of uh, three years. And of course, the directive, as we know, uh, allows member states to provide more generous protection if they want to do so. Now, if we were still in the European Union, as uh, my country voted to remain in the European Union, we would be part of this scheme. But really, there's no reason why we can't emulate it. The Immigration Lawyers Practitioners Association have said that lifting the visa requirement would be, and I quote, the single most effective step that the government can and should take to ensure the efficient evacuation and resettlement of refugees fleeing the invasion of Ukraine. And ILPA have also emphasised that removing the visa requirement wouldn't prevent security checks from being made. Biometric enrolment can occur at the border, as it happens for non-visa nationals arriving as visitors. And border checks can identify persons of legitimate concern without forcing ordinary civilians to take risks under gunfire to lodge visa applications. Now, I know that this current government might find it hard to admit that the European Union has got things right and they've got it wrong, but it might help them to do so, to uh, listen to the advice of Lord Peter Ricketts, our former national security advisor, who last week, speaking in a debate in the other place, said 
that what he regarded as what he described as the wholly inadequate arrangements made by the UK government in and around Calais for receiving Ukrainian refugees, rather than assisting us in our safety in the United Kingdom, is actually threatening our safety because it's undermining the close cooperation we need with our EU neighbours to keep our own citizens safe. And Lord Ricketts uh, elaborated on his thoughts on this subject matter in an interview with Mark, Mark Darcy of the BBC for Today in Parliament. It was broadcast on Radio 4 on Friday night. And he said, drawing on his uh, expertise, that security is always a matter of risk management and there's never a zero risk. But because these refugees are largely women and children, they don't, in his opinion, pose a security risk. Now, that is the opinion of a highly respected former national security adviser who's reported in the past widely on these matters. And he said, and I quote again, that the United Kingdom government needs a much more humane and open approach and shouldn't require visas and shouldn't have security checks until these people are here. So, I say to the minister, if Lord Peter Ricketts thinks we can do it safely, if the European Union can do it safely, if our close and near neighbours, the Republic of Ireland, can do it safely, why can't the United Kingdom get its act together to do away with visas and get these refugees into the country uh, safely and quickly? And I would suggest, uh, Mr Dow, that it's actually a matter of political will and also a degree of hubris on the part of the government because they would have to abandon the sort of political dogma we've seen on refugees and asylum seekers in the Nationality and Borders Bill. And it's not just this crisis that has shown the deep-seated flaws in the Nationality and Borders Bill. If we look at the fiasco in Afghanistan uh, last summer and the fact that many of these people that were supposedly warmly welcomed to our uh, country are still in substandard hotels... We see really that across the world there are crises, crises showing that uh, the British government's approach on these matters is uh, completely wrong. Now, I'm not a big fan of the other place, not because I don't think it's good to have a revising chamber. I think it's really important to have a revising chamber and I very much hope that when Scotland becomes an independent country, mm -hmm. as some of the checks and balances on executive mm -hmm. power, we'll have a revising mm -hmm. chamber. But the problem with the one here is it's not elected. But having said that, it's got some pretty sharp operators in it, people who know their stuff, like Lord Peter Ricketts, and they've realised that big changes are needed to the Nationality and Borders Bill. And, and last week, uh, at, well, in fact, over the last fortnight, in a string of defeats for the government, they've removed some of the most egregious parts of the bill, including the criminalisation of asylum seekers and plans for offshore processing. And it's particularly shocking to reflect that if the UK government got its way, any Ukrainians who uh, made it uh, to uh, our borders with France and then made it across the Channel and tried to claim asylum here would be criminalised. I mean, I mean how, how can that be right? And I think it's very disappointing that there are no Tory backbenchers here to speak to this petition today. I'm sure uh, they have... Um, like us, constituents who are very upset and concerned about this situation. It's not really a party political matter. It's a, I think it's a concern that's shared across the nations of these islands and across political parties. And I think part of the reason for that is that there has been a bit of a moral panic created in the past about the number of asylum seekers crossing the channel to come to the United Kingdom. And I would suggest to Tory backbenchers that they, as well as their government, have a responsibility to quell that moral panic by basing their evidence, uh, their policy making on evidence rather than on scaremongering. And uh, the Joint Committee on Human Rights, of which I'm Deputy Chair, we heard evidence about people crossing the Channel uh, last year. And what we heard was that Greece, Italy and Spain have, already, have all received many more such arrivals in recent years than the United Kingdom. For example, uh, the United Nations reports that in 2020, Italy had around 34,000 sea arrivals, Spain had 40,000, Greece 10,000, compared to the United Kingdom's 8,500. Now, if you put the law to one side, if you just approach this as a moral problem, if, whether you are a, a Christian as I am, or a Muslim, 
or Jewish or of the Sikh faith or whichever faith you are of. This is a moral problem. We're one of the richest countries in Western Europe. The government keeps telling us about how fast our economy is growing, although there is a bit of a question mark over the figures. They pray in aid of that. But if we are one of the richest countries in Western Europe with, the, with a fast-growing economy, why can't we afford to help more of these people? So in closing, what I would say, Mr Chair, is this really is the biggest humanitarian crisis in Europe since the Second World War. And it should challenge all of our thinking about policy and our policy uh, towards our fellow men and women, particularly people right on our doorsteps in continental Europe. And there's never really been a better time for this government to revisit its policy towards refugees and asylum seekers. So let's start with visa-free access for Ukrainian refugees. And then let's follow up with a bit more humble pie and acceptance of the Lord's amendments to the Nationality Bill. Because it's what my constituents and millions of people across the nations of the United Kingdom, it's what they want. The European Union can do it. One of our most senior former security advisors says we can do it without compromising national security. And indeed, he also says that to continue to operate in such a shambolic fashion will actually compromise our national security because it will undermine uh, the chances of good cooperation with our European neighbours. So, Minister, let's hear this afternoon why we can't do it when the EU can do it, why we can't do it when the Republic of Ireland can do it, and what's wrong with Lord Ricketts' analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Dowd. It's a pleasure to speak in the debate and to see you in the chair this afternoon. And can I thank every single petitioner for using their power to act on this matter, and indeed people right across a nation who have stood with refugees over these last few days, as millions of people have crossed borders and millions more are internally displaced, soon to cross, no doubt, themselves into an unknown future until 17 days after this most brutal of conflicts co commenced, the UK showed no recognition of this reality, nor its responsibilities, legal or moral, to give proper sanctuary. The powerful testimonies of families welcoming complete strangers across Europe to form new families has shamed this government. They've asked for no checks or questions, just shown compassion. And yet the hostile dogma of the Home Office is saying women and children and old people fleeing war and terror must first collect a visa as if going on holiday or should opt to pick vegetables from our fields to enter the UK. What a disgrace. They're more at risk themselves than pose any risk to anyone else. And while the U-turn was welcome on Thursday, the impact will be minimal as family members stick together until all have the required documentation that the UK demands, unlike others. As with all passengers, border security checks will scream for immediate safety, as it does any of us. And once people arrive in the UK with their whole lives packed into a single bag, families should then receive any emergency protection visa or documentation and the warmest of welcomes at our ports, airports, or Eurostar. There is no need and no sense in processing visas in centres across Europe. The same can happen here on arrival with no added so-called risk. My constituent's friend sought to get a visa. They went and made inquiries. They were told they should go to a place called Kiev. From the minister's information, Kiev is in the middle of a war zone. That shows the shambolic mess operating across the Home Office. At the same time, support should be given to people for all of their travel. Free travel through Europe and free travel across the UK as people arrive here and then are placed with families. The Home Secretary seems to have confused and conflated security with sanctuary as she has displayed her prejudice. Other nations have put this government to shame, and I am glad to see some movement over the weekend. To home a refugee and their family would be a privilege. While safeguarding is important, bureaucratic hoops 
must be removed. It is what people in, across my constituency want to do. It is what I want to do. And as today we have heard about the Homes for Ukraine regime, that it raises more questions than are answered. What happens after six months? Yeah. What happens yeah. if a placement breaks down? Yeah. Who will then safeguard the interests of that family? Mm -hmm. What about school places? What about access to our NHS? What about access to mental health services, which are already under so Im much immense pressure, and yet specialist trauma services are going to be required? And how are families matched? It seems that refugees somehow have to advertise that they are in need of a home and somehow families offering their homes have to find that match. There needs to be processes in place. And there needs to be systems which are adopted. I believe today's statement just only asks questions, and we desperately need those answers and need those answers now. And the same should be true for the thousands of Afghan refugees who have been imprisoned in bridging hotels for the last seven months they must not be forgotten, as they too have fled terror. And as they are locked away, their mental health is deteriorating and they are feeling abandoned by this government. We need homes for Afghans too, and all that flee. And we must be generous as a country, as our constituents are demanding. This government has too often been on the wrong side of history and the wrong side of humanity. And let not perfection be the enemy of good. If homes are checked and safeguarding agreed, let people come to our constituencies <coughs> and the, the homes of our constituents. Where there is spare capacity in other buildings, and I keep raising the 7,230 empty homes leased by Annington Homes to the MOD, let them be occupied. Let in York the empty care homes be converted and empty hospitals be transition points. All must play their part. No more excuses. I trust that from this point, all of our actions will restore our nation's reputation as its place, as a place of sanctuary for all. Thank you, Mr Dowder. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I'd like to thank the member for Newcastle upon Tyne North for opening this debate and the almost 200,000 members of the public that signed e-petition 609530. I've seen an incredible response to the crisis in Ukraine from my constituents. The compassion and generosity being shown is commendable, but not surprising. The UK has a proud history of providing sanctuary to those fleeing conflict or persecution. The disappointment arising from the government's reluctance to widely open its arms to those fleeing Ukraine is being vocalised across the UK. I hope that the government will now begin moving at pace to reflect the generosity of its citizens in policy making. The government's initial response to the refugee crisis was underwhelming. While they might have expanded that initial commitment some, it isn't enough in the details, including numbers of refugees that will be eligible for the various routes remain unclear. This is not the first refugee crisis this government is needed to grapple with, and unfortunately it won't be the last. The lessons are not being learned and are not informing policy making, because ministers have been unwilling to pull back from decisions unpopular with the British public. The government needs to be able to react swiftly and proportionately. Our international allies have shown their ability to do just that, so there is no excuse for us not doing the same. Reacting rather than proactively planning for these events is not sustainable. Creating bespoke visa processes weeks after a refugee crisis is already underway is inadequate. The government must and immediately provide such resources to ensure that its officials can deal with this crisis effectively and without undue stress or strain on staff. The visa centre in Brussels is struggling to cope with levels of demand. The government will be allowing Ukrainians to make their applications online to address the problem. Applications will still need to be processed and decisions made just behind the scenes. While the Housing Secretary's statement today is welcome, it falls just short of being as helpful as it could be 
People are desperate to help in any way they can, but for that to be meaningful, they need help to organise and mobilise. Here, here. The Minister knows that I've had a constituent offer one of their properties to house a family fleeing Ukraine. Today's statement gives him a little more information, but he is expected to identify refugees himself, if my understanding is correct. If Ukrainians must still go through the visa process, then why can't the government provide that support to match applicants with sponsors? Yeah. Again, they should be directing resource to the necessary places to facilitate that. Leaving it to the public only means it will take longer for Ukrainians to access support that does already exist and is already out there. Throughout this all, from the early threat of Russian invasion right up until the very moment, above all else, the love the Ukrainian people have for their country is apparent. Yep. They don't want to be leaving their homes, their friends, their families. We only need to look at how many civilians have decided to join the conflict and fight for their homes and the future of their country, Ukraine. For the vast majority, they are looking for a temporary sanctuary until it is safe to go home. We should be doing all we can to provide that. Hear, hear. Thank you. Catherine West. Thank you, Mr. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and uh, thank the Honourable Member from New Newcastle for introducing the debate and for all those who signed the petition. The situation in Ukraine is heartbreaking and with continued scenes of dev devastation and loss beamed onto our screens every hour of every day since the launch of President Putin's illegal and illogical invasion. Many of us are suffering just watching it, let alone understanding what must be really happening to people facing this sort of um, attack day in, day out. Mr Dowd, I was very pleased last night to join a number of my constituents outside the uh, Hornsey Church Tower for a simple vigil with the Songworks Choir, the, the Crouch End Festival uh, group, and to hear some children reading poems and having their thoughts about the importance of peace and the importance of understanding how we can push for uh, a peaceful resolution and for President Putin to wake up to himself and stop what he is doing. And I was delighted at the end of the event to meet Marta, one of my constituents' uh, mothers, who came to the UK on Saturday. And I'm sure the minister is relieved to see that there's at least one happy story in this difficult debate. And I just thought I would briefly relay what um, the family went through. Um, so Marta was one of the lucky ones. She managed to flee to Romania after the Russian invasion. But when she tried to reach the UK to be reunited with her daughter and her grandchildren, she did enter a home office bureaucratic nightmare which went on for 10 days. No information on the government's website on how to apply, then a different website which continually crashed. The demand for appointments was so high at one point they were told there were no appointments until May. Then 10 days of sleepless nights for the family and incredible stress, all to bring over the wonderful martyr who I got to meet last night, who was in floods of tears, having seen the solidarity from local people, uh, having met her and just seen what she'd been through. It does seem rather ludicrous that these uh, families are going through this experience at such a difficult time. Uh, Marta's daughter told me, currently the attitude from the Home Office appears to be that it's an immigration process, it's not. People are refugees fleeing war. Even the Ukrainians with family here are being denied a swift passage to come, and that shames our country. So I just also wanted to put on record the first-rate work of my parliamentary staff who rushed down to Port Cullis House to meet the Home Office staff who were there last week, and that that um, casework did actually end up in a result. But I just wonder, um, I wonder what the Minister thinks about all those other people who, for one reason or another, don't have a contact, who are equally desperate as Marta is, but who didn't have that um, hard-working constituency team within an MP's office and have no way of telling us what a terrible situation they're having. So in response to the brutal military campaign, Ukrainians, and it must be said, so many Ukrainian women and children, as always, the worst affected by war, have fled their homes and their country for safety elsewhere in a movement of people not seen in Europe 
since the dark days of 1945. And in response to the grave humanitarian challenge, many Europeans have opened their borders to provide much needed safe refuge to those in need. With Poland host hosting the bulk of those fleeing the devastation, but countries as far as field as Ireland opening their doors in Ukraine's time of need. With an offer of up to 100,000 refugees in a country of a little over 5 million people, whereas of course we are a greater country in population and have a larger economy, and if we had a more efficient government, would have more money to be able to manage um, the needs of all and to manage to encourage people to share. I do welcome what's been announced in the chamber in the last hour, and uh, I think we can all get around that offer now and we can encourage our constituents who do have a spare room or who are able to step in um, to this extraordinary challenge and um, who are able to show that generosity of spirit. Labour colleagues and I have applauded many of these decisions, for example, the one that I've just talked about, but the failings of the Home Office really do need to be reviewed, and I would encourage the Minister, once this Im immediate crisis is over, is to really learn from this and what happened with Af Afghanistan, yeah. which was an embarrassment not just for the Foreign Office, and I know the Shadow Minister for Immigration here, the member for Aberavon, actually is well placed to help with any sort of review in the future because he led on the Afghanistan work from the Foreign Office point of view, but then can also comment on both schemes and how they're getting on. And I do welcome the appointment of a refugee champion in um, Lord um, Harrington, and I think that um, it would be really useful in a short while to have a joint meeting so that we can really thrash out the issues that we as MPs deeply care about and we can help the Home Office, help the Foreign Office to deal with these crises in a much more effective way. Russia's military were massing on Ukraine's borders many months before the invasion and the Ministry of Defence and Intelligence from the US were giving cast iron warnings of an imminent invasion for much of the first part of 2022. And the idea that this just happened 10 days ago is ridiculous. I mean, the minister has of course got first-hand briefings from the security services and will know that this has been going on since well before Christmas even and that we needed to think through what our actions were. We know that the President of Russia lies and is frequent in his lying and so we should have recognised that as a pattern from before and decided to design some risk assessments and put in place staff to deal with it rather than only this weekend there's been what's being called a surge of Home Office staff um, and I feel that this is once again being lurched from crisis to crisis, typical of the government which actually has no strategy, so that when a crisis does come it falls down again, whereas if it had a strategy, if it could learn from its mistakes, we wouldn't be here yet again. We all know that any invasion or military action inherently causes refugee flows, and yet, yet again, behind the curve, woefully out of step with both our European allies and the rest of Whitehall. This is a pattern of behaviour that we must tackle so that the next time that there's something like this, we can really learn from these mistakes. Every day I receive dozens if not hundreds of emails from my constituents in Hornsey and Wood Green, keen to open their house, homes to those in need, willing to offer employment to Ukrainians and generally taken aback by the poor approach to date. We cannot continue to fail those in need. And I urge the Minister to listen to the many calls from today. Get a grip. The Ukrainian people have been added to many Af Afghans seeking support. We owe it to these people in desperate need to live up to our moral responsibilities. Minister, fix the mess. This won't be the final re refugee crisis and we simply cannot accept this shambolic reaction will be the norm each and every time. Thank you, Mr Dowd. Thank you. Marion Fellows. Thank you, Mr Dowd, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I want to thank everyone who's spoken so movingly before today. Mr Dowd, I have mentioned this in the chamber, and I want to reiterate this. My constituent is a UK national with a Ukrainian wife with two daughters. And they started applying to come here on the 12th of February in Dnipro. Since then, my, my constituent's wife and her daughters have had to cross Ukraine and now they are all in Warsaw. I won't go into all, any more detail than that. And this is the latest email I have. And I want to thank the staff downstairs uh, in the hub 
in Port Cullis. I want to thank the Minister as well, because I've been pushing, shouting, screaming, um, doing everything I can to get this man and his, get this man's wife and daughters back to Wishaw. The, the email says, I've just checked, and this is from the Home Office Hub, I've just checked and the family's visas were issued yesterday and manifested to Warsaw today. We will be in touch shortly regarding collection. Please advise Mr Yardley not to travel to the VAC until we contact them. As Mr Yardley's family have already made application and given biometrics, they will have to wait for a decision before travel. I appreciate this is frustrating as the family have, preside, uh, have provided biometrics and they have been granted three years leave outside the rules. Well, I'm, it is frustrating, but I'm pleased. I, we're, we can almost get to see the end of the road. But should it have taken that long? No, of course it shouldn't have. And my constituent is a UK national. And I want to weep when I think of Ukrainians without passports who don't have a UK national to help them. What are we doing as a country? I do not understand why this is happening. OK, I'll rephrase that. I know why it's happening, but it shouldn't be. There have been, as of last week... Uh, the Home Office advice for Ukrainian refugees had been updated nine times and the Home Secretary's jumbled comments in recent days have only added to the confusion. And it's also really uh, concerning to hear the private firms who are cashing in. Can we get that stopped, please, Minister? I think that's obscene mm -hmm. and I think you would agree with that as well. It's really, really heartbreaking that this country... As my honourable friend, the member for Edinburgh South West, has said, as we're a signatory to the UN Convention on Refugees, and the UK has international obligations to recognise refugees who are in the UK and to offer them the protection they need. Get on with it. This is ridiculous. And I wasn't able to be in the chamber today, but I have seen the update on the Ukrainian sponsorship scheme statement from the minister. And I have to say, it, it's six pages, triple, it looks like triple spacing. I used to teach word processing. It looks like triple spacing and very large print. And I can't actually find anything in here that I could give to my constituents that is of any use. And this is what is continuously and continually happening. Would you agree with me that this is a classic case of this government's government by press release rather than a strategy, a plan, a discussion with local government, how to implement things, i.e. doing things properly? I could not agree with the Honourable Member for... Uh, Hornsey and Wood Green, I wrote it down. Um, and can I also say that I agree with the, the Honourable Lady. We're dealing with refugees here, not immigrants. This government needs to get a grip. Could I... The new scheme, one of the new schemes says that Ukrainian refugees will be able to apply online. Hooray. Uh, you're in a war zone. You're fleeing for your life. Do you have internet access? Mm, perhaps. But even if you do, my constituent's application was lost three times in TLS contract system. Three times they had to reapply. And that my constituent had to fly from Warsaw to, to Warsaw to find, and down to, um, I can't remember, somewhere else, down south in Poland, to try and help them get things done. Because three times they had to fill out the forms so could, and they couldn't even make appointments because the system had gone down as well this is not going to work for people what is needed what is needed is what the first minister has said let people in and do the paperwork later yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. common humanity demands it other countries have done it why can't we? I thought this was supposed to be global Britain and we were all on the front foot trying to help. Minister, please take this on board. Wave the visas. This is what has to happen to get these poor refugees, refugees into the UK.
Thank you. Mick uh, Whitley. Under your chairmanship. And I also thank all of my constituents who have lent their names to this important petition and to the countless others who have made contact to urge me to speak up for you Ukrainians fleeing from this devastating conflict or with offers to open their homes to families in need of sanctuary. The British people have responded to this crisis with characteristic generosity, empathy and hospitality. But not so their elected governments. As countries across Europe have thrown open their doors to the millions of Ukrainians forced from their homes, the UK alone has refused to lift visa requirements. Last week we learned that while Poland has welcomed more than one million Ukrainians since the conflict began, the Home Office, the Home Office had approved visas for just 300. Ireland, a country with a population just a fraction of our own, has already accepted more than 5,000. The government is now promising major improvements in the number of people who are being admitted to the UK, to the UK and the speed with which applications are being processed. Given the recent and unforgivable, unforgivable betrayal of Afghan nationals who risked their lives to support British forces in Afghanistan, it is a promise in which we can have very little confidence and it's simply not good enough. Let's be clear. Desperate Ukrainians are no more migrants than the thousands of Yemenis, Afghans and Iraqis whom this government have left stranded in Cali. Uh, all, they are refugees and none of them have had the luxury of time. And so I wholeheartedly endure the objectives of this petition. The time has come to waive all visa requirements for people fleeing the conflict in Ukraine and establish safe and legal routes into Britain. History will not judge kindly a government that fails the Ukrainian people in their time of greatest need. But sadly, I have little confidence in the Home Office to do the right thing. There is surely no politician in recent memory whose career has been defined by such cruelty, indifference, to suffering and gross incompetence as this Home Secretary. And I'm afraid to say that the, run, the rot runs deep. In fact, when the Minister himself was challenged on the gross inadequacy of support available to, peop to people fleeing Putin's war on Ukraine, he had the audacity to say that refugees could apply for seasonal worker visas so they could come to the UK to pick fruit. In any other government, such an appalling statement would undoubtedly result in a letter of resignation being handed to the Prime Minister. This Minister couldn't even bring himself to apologise. Shame, shame, shame. I hope that instead of parroting the same side lines we have to hear all often from the dispatch box, he takes the opportunity to re reflect on what has been said today. Recognise how badly his department has misjudged the mood of the public and mistreated innocent victims and returns to his colleagues in government with a loud and unequivocal message that refugees are welcome here. <laughs> Mr Chairman, I hope that the response to this crisis begins with a step change now in how we treat all those displaced by war, persecution and climate breakdown. For far too long the Conservatives have thrown up the walls to those in desperate need of a safe place and whipped up hatred in the media for its own political advantage. And even now, when confronted by images of human suffering none of us ever thought to see again in Europe, the Home Secretary persists in her efforts to turn Great Britain into Fortress Britain, including with her shameful attempts to deploy the Royal Navy to stop crossings in the English Channel. But it's not too late for ministers to recognise the errors of their ways. It's not too late for the government to finally begin to honour its moral obligations and to lead the way in humanitarianism instead of callousness and cruelty. And it's not too late to tear up the Nationality and Borders Bill before it becomes law, which will inflict such immense suffering on those in greatest need of all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. And it's a pleasure to serve under your chairship, and I'm grateful to the Honourable Member uh, for Newcastle upon Tyne North for opening the debate uh, on behalf of the Petitions Committee in such a strong way. Um, before I begin, can I refer the House to my entry in the Register of Members' Financial Interests because I have help from the Refugee Asylum Migration Project for my work in this area. Um, I would just want to start by saying a couple of things about the Homes for UK scheme that we've just seen as going on in the Chamber at the moment. Uh, I've got a number of concerns about this scheme and I, I welcome it and I'm glad that the government have taken the opportunity to recognise the generosity of the people of this country. But I do share the concerns of the Refugee Council. Um, Enver Solomon in The Guardian is quoted as saying, effectively, 
This is a managed migration route which is not suitable for use to respond to a humanitarian crisis. There was also another comment saying this sounds a little bit like fostering without a social worker. And I really want to hear from the Minister that the adequate support for every family who come through the scheme is given to local authorities and those partner organisations that are going to have to support these people through a very critical, traumatic time. I think it's also right that we should say and state very clearly that every family with a child should have a safeguarding assessment before they're placed. The Minister nods his head, but you know, this is not commonplace in the Home Office at the moment with other schemes. So I think it's really important that we recognise that. I'd also think that you know, we need to go back to the fact that this isn't the broadest scheme that we could see. This isn't going to provide the opportunity for a right to work and access to benefits. It's not an emergency protection visa. And as a city of sanctuary, where Sheffield has a proud history of supporting refugees and asylum seekers, we're keen to do whatever we can. Hundreds of my constituents have signed this petition today and many more will be involved in the solidarity efforts in other ways, whether that's donating money to emergency services, organising collections like Crook Social Club or writing to me to express their concerns over the government's approach. There's been a huge outpouring of support for Ukrainians within my city. And the other great thing about my city is our universities and they're offering support to their students and staff alike but more needs to be done to allow family reunion for those individuals. It's not right that a nurse here can't bring over their family if they're on the wrong type of visa. I think that more needs to be done on that. I also think that there's more that universities could be doing to help change the lives of thousands of young people in Ukraine who have had the university teaching cut short. Um, so I hope the minister is talking to the university's minister about potential avenues of support for students in Ukraine. Last week, the Home Secretary announced her plans to allow Ukrainians with passports to apply for visas online. Of course, I welcome any steps to make it easier for people to come here. However, the UK response remains inadequate compared to our European partners. Now, this is just in the family scheme, which we should say, um, and I have several concerns over this scheme, many of which have been raised by honourable members in this debate. But particularly, I wanted to highlight the fact that the new online application will only be accessible to those with a passport and the right type of passport. And yet, some of the most vulnerable people are least likely to own one. How can we expect people who have never travelled outside Ukraine to complete these applications, especially as those applications are in English? Or, you know, my heart is going out to those families. You know, there's been 4,000 births in bomb shelters, there's been caesareans done in the dark for fear of bombing. These are very vulnerable people and you know, I, think, I think that we should be making it as easy as possible for people who, have, who are going through the worst ordeal mm -hmm. to get here. Okay. Ministers have also acknowledged that most Ukrainians don't have a passport, making most potential applicants ineligible for this online way of applying. That's why it's hard to square this with the government claims that this scheme will free up appointments in visa centres for the most vulnerable and most complex cases, I asked last week what assessment has been done to understand who will benefit from the online move. And as the member for St Albans mentioned, <laughs> we don't even know if people should keep their appointments or free up those appointments at the moment. And it's unclear from those who are providing information what people should do. Much more must be done to remove barriers that prevent people from getting here safe, safely. And we should think in the long term too. We cannot forget the cruel Nationalities and Borders Bill, which will see the UK abandon its obligations not only to Ukrainians, but to all refugees. Latest po polling by British Future shows that three in four agree with the principle that those fleeing war and persecution should be able to take refuge in other countries, including the UK. This clearly shows that the government is misjudging the public's desire to help and the public's mood. It's time ministers caught up with the public mood and stretched every sinew to help those fleeing in the violence in Ukraine and provide the support they and all refugees urgently need. Mm -hmm. Mr Chairman, uh, first of all, can I thank the Honourable Lady for Newcastle upon Tyne North for 
uh, introducing the, the debate uh, through the petition. And Donald Leary, as always, does these things with, with, a, uh, with a detail and information that helps us set the scene so very well. To be honest, uh, Mr Chairman, it's probably fairly easy to set the scene because our minds are full of it each and every day uh, as we watch TV in the morning and watch TV at night. Uh, and it means that uh, each and every one of us as well are, are eternally frustrated uh, at where we are. The Honourable Lady for, for uh, Motherwell and Wisha made a, a very straightforward request. And I tell you what, I absolutely agree with the Honourable Lady. Uh, and it's, you know, when you see the suffering, you see the pain, you see the, 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 the chaos, and you see the need, I say to myself, get them here. Process it out whenever you get them here. Yeah. And let's do that. I, I say that with great respect to the Minister, by the way. I, I'm not being critical. I, I, I know the, the Minister uh, wants to help. But I just, I just feel so frustrated with a system that seems to be bogged down. The, the petitioners are 185,000 and the petition list, other petitions as well. Um, that large volume of emails urging our government um, are reflected in my mailbag and everyone else's mailbag here today as well. Uh, and as uh, the Honourable Lady to, um, gave some examples earlier on, nothing I think illustrates, Mr Chairman, uh, better than examples, and the Honourable Lady uh, did those as well. So, uh, um, again, I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, as we've heard, the, the Homes for Ukrainian scheme, which we didn't hear in the chamber because we were here, uh, but the minister has, has informed us, and, and we're presuming uh, what it means that has happened. Um, the, the, I'm thankful that the Home Office has decided to heed the calls for a, an easier form of visa and allowing Ukrainians to, to get here and go through biometrics when they get here. I think that's what the Honourable Lady wants to see, and it's certainly what I want to see, mm -hmm. but we should widen that as well, uh, because if we do it for those, those ones, I think we can do it for, for more. The Homes for Ukrainian scheme is exactly what we need and allows the individuals, the charities, the community groups and the businesses across the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to offer a room or a home rent-free to Ukrainians escaping the war, regardless of whether they have ties to the country. And for me, this enables the link to be established by many people who have offered homes but don't know how to go about it. One lady rang my, my office this morning. I, I, I know the lady very well. Uh, her generosity uh, uh, is reflected in her daily life. But this morning, that lady, uh, but through her family, has a, a four-bed house in Newton Ards uh, in the North Road that's available. She says, I want to offer that house to a family. Now, that's replicated, Mr Chairman. Uh, each and every one of us would have lots and lots of examples. Um, I, I, another company I've offered two uh, uh, properties in, in the West Windsor Newton Arts. Uh, other people have offered rooms uh, to sponsor families. Uh, what, what I see, Mr Chairman, is right, uh, lots of good right now. Uh, and, and what I've said to the Minister, and he knows this, in the past, when all these people are offering all these things, we should be doing our uh, darnest to make sure we get them here and get them housed as soon as possible. Um, one, one of my uh, constituents, um, uh, he's married to a Ukrainian, he came to see me on Saturday morning. His um, uh, stepdaughter uh, has a t just so happens to have a two-year visitor's visa, which means that she can come out because the paperwork's there for her. But what she told um, uh, um, Gary, and Gary told me at, uh, on Saturday morning, uh, whenever she went to Warsaw to get a plane home with the paperwork that she had, which is okay, there was dozens and dozens of, of Ukrainians at the Warsaw, Warsaw at the airport uh, wanting to get, to, to get here but didn't have the paperwork. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see those people as, 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 as a, um, in a dire case, in a priority case, and a need to, to, to move right away. Um, I, I would ask the Minister, and again, I understand the scheme that's been announced will be a £350 a week to those families who uh, can help the, the, um, uh, and, and house and, and assist the Ukrainian families. But I also understand um, that the, there's a £10,000 uh, would be offered for each uh, citizen to ensure that they can get the health jobs, that education is in place. The system in, in the UK mainland, Mr. Ch uh, uh, Mr Chairman, and also to the Minister, is very different from what we have in Northern Ireland. The councils don't have responsibility directly for education, for health and so on. So I want to just understand how the councils in Northern Ireland uh, can access that money, which is directly done in the, in the mainland here very, very simply. But for us in Northern Ireland, it will be a slightly different process. And I want to make sure we can do that so we're all over the process on how to, on how to make it happen. Um, and, and with that in mind, I, I'm ever mindful of, of, of the need to, to move forward. I'm also, uh, not, not myself, but 
but there, there's a charity in, 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 in Newton Arts called Faith in Action Charity. They do some great work out in Ukraine. They're, they're a Christian charity. They've been working in Ukraine for 21 years. Uh, and they've got the Ukrainians here ready to come here. Uh, I think this scheme, I'm, I'm hoping, Mr Chairman, that this scheme that the, the government has announced, and I know the minister will be over, uh, is one that can enable these people to come right now uh, to the accommodation, the faith in action. I've got some uh, 100 uh, family groups who can bring in individuals and bring in families as well and, and to that. Also, last uh, Friday a week ago, I met uh, Willowbrook Foods in, in, in Newton Ards. They are offering 100 jobs. They have 100 vacancies in their company, by the way, but they are offering 100 jobs to people. So we can get people into Newton Arts. We can get them into houses. We can get them into accommodation. We can get them the jobs that they want. We can get them employment that they want to do. All these things, all these things, Mr Chairman, are waiting, waiting just for this scheme to come into place. So again, uh, um, I, I want to maybe make sure that we can uh, uh, ensure that that happens. The local Enum Charity shop have offered to furnish and supply clothing uh, and, and, uh, and they wanted my constituents also another one this morning uh, just people's generosity Mr Chairman is incredible uh, and there's a guy um, John McNutt he's going to do a charity uh, event which he does every year for a charity but he does it this year and he goes around Northern Ireland and he's going to lift money and charity and whether it be physical goods whether it be finance and money and that'll be him signing off at 10 o'clock next Monday local churches have indicated their willingness to provide lunches and dinners in their church halls until refugees are settled in or until they are not needed. So of, of all these multitude of people uh, in, in Strangford, and my constituents, the, the most wonderful people, as others have referred to their constituents, and the wonderful people that there is there as well, we, we, people are waiting anxiously to help. So I know this generosity will be replicated throughout Northern Ireland. Indeed, employers who are having difficulty hiring staff, because there's other companies I've, I've, I've contacted as well, are saying that they can help and will give employment to those able to work to enable them to provide. All of the parts of the puzzle are there. All the parts are there. We now need to connect the dots and get in place a support system that is needed to get these people out of safety, uh, to safety, uh, until it's safe to return to their homeland to start the rebuilding process, which they very much hope that they will be able to do. And uh, I am so thankful, and I put it on record, uh, to the Home Office for allowing our British hospitality and ment a mentality of mucking in to take place. And I look forward to understanding the full details, finer details of the system, uh, the Ukrainian uh, scheme that the government has referred to today, uh, to, to enable the people in my community to do what they have been asking to do since the invasion, and indeed every day since, be of some help to these poor people. The, 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 also, a, a charity called Hope for Youth. Um, uh, it's on our news back home. I suspect it may be on the news, uh, the main news as well. Uh, they, they have organised 25 container loads of, of uh, all sorts of uh, goods that are necessary: medical, clothing, food. Um, Montgomery Transport are, are, are paying for the lorries themselves to go from here to Poland. Uh, the, then there's lorries from Ukraine uh, meeting them, and, and then they're taking all that across the border. So what I see is, 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 is a group groups of people, individuals, collectively. Uh, the, the, the effort is, is magnificent, but what we need, Mr Chairman, is, is our government to, to simplify the position, simplify the scheme, and ensure that we can move forward. Um, so I'm very thankful to those who have donated goods and hygiene packs, and for those who have travelled in containers to provide goods and food to refugees on the border, and to those brave souls who take, a, take food in their cars into their cane, to the thousands of people trapped in towns and cities with no food and medicine. We need, I believe, to do more to secure these routes to get essential food and medicine into all areas of, of Ukraine. The Faith and Action Group, uh, the, the, where they work is in the northeast of Ukraine, in the Donetsk region, uh, which is under incredible attack from Russia at this moment in time. Again, I would urge the Minister in his seat, please make the process streamlined and easy and enable those with homes to connect with the families that need the home. And I'd ask, if I can, Minister, um, I'm, I'm quite a simple person. I like to see things nice and simple so that I can tell people just how simple they are. Uh, so I ask for a step-by-step -step guidance to be issued to each member of this House, as I am sure that many, many other members are in the same position with constituents wanting to help and not knowing what the process really is. I say that with great respect. I, I just, it's just to understand it better, and so we can, we can help. And I conclude, Mr Chairman, with this. We need to make the path clear, straightforward, and above all, get these women and children to safety. 
uh, to, to me, the priority is to get them here because there's people willing to help, uh, and, and the need is now. And so, so I pray for Ukraine in the days leading up to the inevitable invasion by Russia. M many others in this room as ha have as well. Honourable Lady for, for um, Lewisham uh, um, um, uh, East referred to that uh, in, in the biblical text that you referred to, and it's so important that we as Christians, and the Honourable Lady as well referred to it just beforehand, uh, that we as Christians can, can collectively come together. But there are lots of other religious groups who want to help equally as much, uh, and, and this is a, a, a combination of, of, of religious groups, of family members, of this great nation, of the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland coming together. And along with the prayer, we need to practically help. So I'm urging the Minister to make the, that way a simple process at this time. When only one thing really matters, in my opinion, Mr. Chairman, and the opinion of all others, the safety of those little lives and the vulnerable people who need our help right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gray, and uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, my, my colleagues as well for their forbearance, and uh, I apologise for not being here for, from the start of the debate. I'm grateful for your indulgence. Um, my small, very small London borough is still one of the top 20. Uh, local authorities in the country in terms of number of uh, Ukrainian-born residents, but it is an extremely diverse borough. I won't pretend that we are yet have as many cases as we did, for example, with, the, uh, with Afghan refugees last year, because I have several hundred of those. But it's a significant number, and it is growing. And, and one of the reasons it is growing is because the Home Office is not dealing with the problem. Um, and these are problems. They're very different, uh, very different circumstances. The one thing they all have in common is that they are victims of Home Office bureaucracy. So I have families in the Ukraine still, in Poland, in France. I have families who have had to split up because some can get further than others. Some have even got to the, the UK um, in this sort of grotesque game of snakes and ladders where can you get to the next stage without uh, going, back to, uh, going back rather than, than forwards. Um, I have some UK na nationals. Who, who are with spouses or other relatives who are Ukrainian, um, but who are finding closed visa centres, so they can't get through the uh, visa centres. Um, I've even got people in the UK at the moment whose visas are expiring or expired or have been so delayed in applying for them that they're worried about being sent back or being sent out of the country. I hope the Minister will reassure us on that point at least, that there is no intention to exclude anybody uh, in, in, that, in that way. But... <clears throat> And I asked my caseworker for an update today on all the cases, and almost every one ends with the line, we've had no responses from the Home Office to any of our inquiries, or have made urgent inquiries to the Home Office, but no response yet. And that, we are seeing a repetition of what happened with Afghanistan last year, I'm afraid. The system simply isn't working. Uh, uh, can I, r rather than... Uh, every, every, every case turns on, on its own facts, but uh, I've all with the... Uh, my Ms. Gray, just read a, an email I've had which I think highlights quite a lot of the problems. <coughs> uh, this is from a constituent I got two or three days ago. Circumstances may have changed, but I don't think they have. My wife's daughter-in-law, along with her 12-year-old son, fled Ukraine and are now in Warsaw, uh, Warsaw in Poland. In the last four days, they have both been ill, probably due to cold, exhaustion and stress. They are now safely in the flat with friends of friends, but she does not speak Polish or English. Because of this, we have been trying to get them an appointment at the Visa Application Centre in Warsaw. This has involved us getting texts and images from Poland and Ukraine, together with copies of documents we have in the UK. I have filled out their application forms, amassed all the evidence I can, and emailed it to friends for them to print ahead of the appointment. I am erudite, but even I have struggled with some of the English on the websites. Yeah. So it would be almost impossible to do this in Poland with no knowledge of English and with no access to a computer. Firstly, the application form, which is eight pages long, has to be completed in English. Once the application is submitted online, uh, the gov.uk website directs you to a commercial partner's website called TLS. There you can download a seven-page checklist, which has to be completed in English. But then the website is not allowing you to download your completed checklist and accompanying documents. On the website, you can also an book an appointment. And you can't, because the website is not allowing you to do that either. <laughs> Even when we can secure an appointment, some of the evidence is in Ukrainian and so probably will not be accepted by the Visa Application Centre. Also, because they fled in a hurry, 
they do not have all the documentary evidence required. Mm. Once they have attended an appointment, there's no indication of how long they may have to wait to hear if their applications are successful. Mm. He ends by saying this, they are our family, we own our own home in Shepherd's Bush, have room to accommodate them and money to cover all their expenses. But the red tape is not allowing them to come here. I hope you and your colleagues can put pressure on the Home Office to relax the rules immediately. Now, I'm not going to talk about the name of, 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 the, of the family, even though I don't think they would mind if I did. The Home Office has all those details. It's had them for some days. We haven't had a response. That is true on almost every case. Mm. I, yes, the, every case will be different on its facts, but I hope the Minister can see there is a common thread here, which is the pro, that the systems in place at the moment are active, and I don't know whether this is willful or negligent or, uh, or, or just happenstance and it's something they're trying to, uh, to correct. But the net effect is the opposite of what the government is saying. Yes. That they are saying we want to help, they're saying we will help, they're saying we will significantly help mm. in the hundreds of thousands. Mm. And yet the, 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 the case, every case that I say mm. says that that is not true. That's right because every case is stalled at some, right. at some hurdle, either geographical or bureaucratic, because of the way that the Home Office behaves. So please, I just say this to the Minister. Well, I'll say two things. One, can you reply to my emails? I don't think that's too much uh, to, to ask, given the urgency. And two, can you look at this in the round and look at our duty as a compassionate country that wants to take, take in refugees? I, I believe the government on that. I believe that they genuinely want to help. But let's see some proof, shall we? Oh, thank you very much, Mr Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve under your uh, chairship. Uh, today's debate was opened by the Honourable Member for Newcastle-upon-Tyne North, and her speech demonstrated not just that she is knowledgeable about what is happening in this crisis, but that she cares deeply. In fact, everyone who's spoken today, I couldn't just hear the words that they cared, I could feel it. And it's... I wouldn't like to say it's not often that <laughs> we, we, we feel that in here, but I have never felt it to this extent that I felt today. Everybody cares, and we need to get something done about this as soon as possible. Let me start by saying that the fault for what is happening to the people in Ukraine lies solely with Vladimir Putin and the Russian regime. Not the Russian people, not any of us, not any of the governments that make up the UK or Europe, certainly not the people of Ukraine. The blame lies fairly and squarely with Vladimir Putin and his regime. It's important to acknowledge that. But the fact that we did not cause the situation is irrelevant when it comes to offering our support. Mr Chair, along with my uh, friend and colleague, the Honourable Member for Cumbernauld, Kilsyth and Kirkintilloch East, I've been heavily involved in scrutinising the Nationality and Borders Bill. So when Russia so cruelly invaded and started bombing Ukraine and government ministers started to remind us of Britain's benevolent history, I worried. I worried a lot. I worried because I know that the refugee sector, naming it the anti-refugee bill, was no exaggeration but an accurate description of what it is. And I worried because you don't bring forward a bill like that if you have any desire to protect people fleeing war, violence, terror. The Nationality and Borders Bill is clearly trying to send a signal that benevolent Britain is no more. Don't come here because you will not be welcome. And of course, I know the bill has not yet been enacted. Today it reaches report stage in the Lords. So whilst I knew that Ukrainians fleeing right now before this legislation is enacted would be subject to the existing laws and rules, I'm also very aware of how dreadful the current situation already is and acutely aware of the attitude from this government to people in desperate need. And that is why I was worried. But I hoped, I hoped, Mr Chairman, that the suddenness, the intensity, the urgency, and yes, sadly, the fact that they were European, which apparently makes a difference, although it should not, would kickstart the government into action, that they would treat it as an emergency, a humanitarian catastrophe that we simply had to help with first and sort out the details later. Because that's what other countries have done. Poland, Germany, France, Italy. As per usual, they've taken far more proportionately than we have or ever will of that, I am sure. The government keeps telling whoever will listen that the UK takes in more people than any other EU country. And it's not true. Last week at PNQs, the Prime Minister said that the UK had done more to resettle vulnerable people than any other European country since 2015. But it's not true. When you look at the numbers per head of population, which is the only 
fair way to do it. Look at it, for every 100,000 people, Sweden takes in 1,619. For every 100,000 people, Germany takes in 1,274. For every 100,000 people, Austria takes in 1,134. For every 100,000 people, Switzerland takes in 955. Does the minister want me to tell him, because I don't know if he knows this, how many we take in? For every 100,000 people, we take in 121, which makes the UK 17th, sometimes 18th, on uh, the rankings in Europe. And as my uh, honourable friend said there, it is shocking. And, and, and no European country can even top the list globally because it's the developing countries, the countries most in need themselves, that take in the most. Yes, that's right, those with the least giving the most. More than 80% of the world's displaced people are living in developing countries. And as we've heard today, the government have had to be dragged kicking and screaming into the level of support now being offered to Ukrainians, which still doesn't match other comparable countries or other poorer countries. One day, they'll only offer refuge if you have a family connection, and that can only be a very narrow definition of family. The next they change it so other family members can come over, but they still need a visa and a passport. Then some of them don't need a visa, but some do. And those who don't have a passport still have to apply from Ukraine or wherever they've fled to, but there are no appointments. Absolutely. Yeah. It's always very easy, Mr Chairman, to, to, to ask, have they got a passport? But whenever the bombs are falling, the bullets are flying, your building's falling around you, you're in fear of your life, the last thing you go is lift your passport or your identification, you get out and you move. So for many people, they haven't got it. Not because they don't have the, the, the passport information, but because they haven't got it with them, because it's lying in their wrecked house back where they came from. Absolutely agree. And for many people, they've never had a passport because they've never had the money to go anywhere where they would require a passport. Um, they can't afford the passport. Um, and as, as the Honourable Member said, you know, lots of people don't know where... I don't know where my passport is because I'm not planning to go anywhere soon. I am not planning to be in the middle of a war zone and have to know where it is. And then there are appointments available, but the appointment will be in a fortnight's time. Or as we've heard from the Honourable Member for St Albans, Albans, sorry, Albans, sorry. <laughs> they, get, they get through everything, they jump through all the hoops, they pass the test, and then they're told to travel 350 miles to pay up, pick up the paperwork. It's ridiculous. Or as the Honourable Member for Hampstead and Kilburn told us, they get to their appointment only to be told to discard their seven-year-old child who can't, isn't allowed to come in. Now, I accept that cannot be Home Office policy. So, and I did see the Minister frantically messaging to find out what would happen there. So, but what kind of person would do that? I mean, really, is that the kind of person that you want in that job? I'm absolutely certain nobody thinks that person is suitable um, to be in that job. And it's chaos. It's chaos. The Right Honourable Member for Hammersmith likened it to a game of snakes and ladders, and he's not wrong. If it's confusing for honourable members and their teams trying to keep up with what advice we can give people, how much more confusing is it for someone in a state of heightened anxiety who doesn't necessarily speak English? It's almost as if this government doesn't want Ukrainians to come here. And, and other members made some very important points today. The honourable member for Edinburgh South West said it was a disgrace that several weeks on... This has still not been properly set up. And I share that feeling, but I imagine neither of us are surprised because we will both have ongoing contact with Afghans who are stuck in Afghanistan, pleading, begging us to help all these months on, and we still have no advice for them. As the Honourable Member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West said, there are people ready to help Ukrainians. We're getting emails daily from people who want to help. They don't know how. And obviously I haven't seen the statement in the Chamber, but I'm not hearing that there is much clarity coming forward. As the Honourable Member for Motherwell and Wishaw and others have pointed out, if you're in a war zone, how are you supposed to apply online? Sometimes the internet is bad enough here where we're not in a war zone. How are you supposed to get internet to be able to do that? And, and I could hear the exhaustion in her voice as she spoke so movingly about her constituent and his struggle to get his family into Fortress Britain. He would still be battling if she hadn't fought tooth and nail for him. But what of all those who don't have that support? And why are the experts in the field not being consulted? 
Refugee Action, the Refugee Councils of England, Wales or Scotland. Positive Action in Housing is an organisation in Glasgow that has had a long-running project where people can host refugees. And I would want to be clear that anyone generous enough to offer is being properly checked because the dangers are obvious. Perhaps the government could speak to groups like Positive Action in Housing. I'd also want to know that every single person taken into someone's home has the knowledge, the confidence and the means to reach out for help. Uh, I therefore suspend the sitting for 50 minutes with one vote, or, or 25 with two votes, after which I think we'll probably move on to the uh, Labour uh, opposition. Uh, order.
Uh, order, order. Uh, and I call Anne McLaughlin, who was so uh, rudely interrupted by the bell. Anne McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so, I, I want to turn to what... The, I know that the Minister is going to say that these things all take time, and they do, but is he really saying that we couldn't keep up with other comparable European countries? Surely if we are so much more bountiful in our approach to refugees, then we therefore have more experience and should at least be able to equal the speed of other European countries. He will also no doubt repeat the trope that we can't dispense with visas for security reasons. And they really need to stop pretending that what we are asking for here is anything unusual. Thousands of people enter the UK every day without visas. Anyone coming from South Korea, Australia, Mexico, 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 the US, Costa Rica, that was Mexico and Costa Rica moved together, um, and many other countries is not required to have a visa. So if we're to believe that allowing Ukrainians to do that poses a threat to our safety, then they must surely believe that the thousands arriving from those countries today and yesterday and tomorrow pose an equal threat to our safety. Or are they seriously arguing that Ukrainians are uniquely likely to be infiltrated and pose a threat? And as we've heard, a security expert who the government certainly previously trusted does not share their apparent fears. And I'll repeat the question posed to the Minister by the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South West. What was wrong about what Lord Ricketts had to say? And remember, the two Russians who caused such turmoil in Salisbury didn't sneak in pretending to be another nationality. They came in on visas. So in any case, a visa alone is not a safeguard. I want to congratulate and thank the petitioner, Philip Jolliffe, and the efforts he went to to get so many people to sign this petition. 184,949 people signed it. And I'll end by saying that what I think is the most alarming part of the way that we are treating Ukrainian refugees, Mr Chairman, that is that as confusing and chaotic and cold as their treatment has been so far, we are treating Ukrainian refugees better than we treat refugees fleeing other countries. And we are treating them a million times better than we will treat anyone, including other Ukrainians, anyone who dares to ask for our protection once the Nationality and Borders Bill is enacted. If people are ashamed right now, and I suspect those who signed the petition are, they should prepare themselves to feel a whole new level of shame once that comes in. We can correct that for the record. As I said to uh, the speaker the other day, sir, I've been having that since I was 13 years old. and You, you won't be the first, and I'm sure you won't be the last. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mr. Gray, and um, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairship, sir, and I'd like to thank the Petitions Committee and uh, my honourable friend, the member for Newcastle-upon-Tyne North, for bringing this vitally important debate before us. And, of course, I'd also like to thank the thousands and thousands of petitioners who have all made their voices heard today, I think, I hope, uh, through us. I want to begin my remarks by paying tribute to the Ukrainian people whose bravery, fortitude, and eventual victory will never be forgotten. President Zelensky is the leader of the free world, and he and his compatriots are fighting not only for Ukraine's freedom and democracy, but for the values that we all hold dear. They are showing tremendous courage, dignity, and defiance in the face of Russia's barbaric assault. What a contrast, I'm afraid to say, with the failure of the Home Office to rise to the challenge. From the Windrush scandal to the small boats crisis, and from the Nationality and Borders Bill to the response to Putin's barbaric assault on Ukraine, we are witnessing a government department whose approach is defined by a toxic combination of incompetence and indifference. Let us turn for a moment to the broader context of this refugee crisis. We know that the vast majority of the Ukrainians who are leaving their country want to stay as close as possible to it. They are passionately patriotic, and as such, they will want to get back to their homes once the invaders have been defeated and Ukraine is once again able to rebuild as a vibrant, prosperous, and democratic country. It is also the case, however, that some people will want to come to the UK, and it is crystal clear that we should be welcoming them with open arms. Britain has a proud history of acting as a safe sanctuary for those fleeing war and persecution. The kinder transport 
during World War II, for example, saved the lives of almost 10,000 children. Since the invasion of Ukraine started on the 24th of February, over 2 million people have fled, and neighboring countries such as Poland, Romania, and Hungary have taken hundreds and thousands of refugees each. And that is to be expected for the reasons that I have already outlined. But it is not only countries on the borders of Ukraine who have shown great humanitarian spirit. Just look at Ireland, a population of only 4 million, and yet they've already accepted 5,500 Ukrainians. Now let us turn to the dismal performance of the UK government, a country of 66 million, and we've only given visas to 4,000 Ukrainians, set against 17,100 applications received. The Home Office is currently offering two schemes, as we have heard today. The first is the family reunion route. For those Ukrainians already resident in Britain, it allows entry to some, not all, of their relatives. We, on these opposition benches, finally shamed the government into widening the family reunion route to include extended family, but it still fell far short of where it needed to be. For example, a nurse on a healthcare visa was not allowed to bring his or her family into the UK because he or she didn't have indefinite leave to remain. This was beyond unacceptable. And we welcome the U-turn that was secured today. But I ask the Minister why did it take so long? Why do we appear to be having U-turns on an almost daily basis? It sends a signal that the government is having to be dragged, kicking and, kicking and screaming to do the right thing. It does not reflect well on the government, and I'm afraid it leaves a stain on our international reputation. The second programme, the Community Sponsorship Scheme, supposedly allows charities and individuals to sponsor Ukrainians even with no family ties. A pressing concern is that the Community Sponsorship Scheme will become mired in bureaucracy and red tape. The Minister will no doubt be aware of a recent report by the Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, which states that the application to arrival timescale of current similar schemes ranges from 73 to 398 days. I am sure that the Minister doesn't think that it could take up to 73 days for these desperate Ukrainians uh, to be given access to our country, and I hope that he will reassure us today that that will not be the case. Mr Gray, these processes are burdened with excessive red tape and bureaucracy, but there is also an issue around the institutional performance. The location of the visa centre, supposedly being set up in northern France to assist refugees, will not be made public, and it doesn't offer appointments or walk-in access. The Home Secretary claims that a visa office in Calais will pose too much of a security threat, and yet the Prime Minister overruled our own security services to insist that Yevgeny Lebedev be given a peerage. I think that tells us all we need to know about the priorities of this government. As my right honourable friend, the Shadow Home Secretary, said last week, we are pushing vulnerable people from pillar to post in their hour of need. It is immoral to be creating this sense of confusion when all people need is a place to feel safe and secure. And it doesn't have to be this way. It could be so much simpler. Labour believes in putting people before paperwork, which is why we're calling for an emergency protection visa that would be so much simpler than the community sponsorship scheme that was announced today. Our emergency visa would be based on the necessary biometric and security checks, but it would dispense with all the bureaucracy and red tape that the government is proposing, and it would end the bottlenecks and queues by facilitating quick and easy access efficiently to our country in these dark times for the Ukrainian people. Mr Gray, in light of the chaotic and heartbreaking situation that so many honourable friends and members have described so eloquently in their contributions today, I have the following questions for the Minister. Firstly, last week, in Prime Minister's questions, the Prime Minister claimed that his government has done more to resettle vulnerable people than any other European country. Since 2015, the UK has accepted 92,000 refugees, while Germany, for example, has accepted over one million. The Prime Minister has again played fast and loose with the facts. So will the Minister be encouraging his right honourable friend to correct the record? 
On the community sponsorship route, can the Minister provide an indication of the application to arrival timescale that the Government is expecting? It would clearly be completely and utterly unacceptable if Ukrainian applicants were expected to wait for 73 days and potentially up to above 300 days for their applications under this scheme to be approved. And finally, why won't the Government take our advice and implement Labour's emergency protection visa so that any Ukrainian can come to our country to seek refuge? Mr Gray, I have to be honest when I say that the Home Office's failures on this do not surprise me in the slightest. This Government has consistently and systematically failed refugees since 2010. You only have to look at their response to Afghans fleeing the horrors of the Taliban, with thousands still stuck in hotels here in our country. The bureaucratic quagmire that was created for those who wanted to house those seeking refuge from the horrors of the Syrian war, or those seeking to cross at the English Channel looking for sanctuary. And to add insult to injury, they are using the Nationality and Borders Bill as a tool for criminalising those who are seeking sanctuary in our country. If the government wishes to improve this record, they have to start showing some empathy and some efficiency. And that has to start right now with the way in which we're seeing the treatment of those who are fleeing Putin's bombs and bullets. They can do this by ending the bureaucratic and hostile environment they've created. We therefore urge the minister to remove the bottlenecks, to simplify the process. Our message to him, to the Home Secretary and to the Prime Minister is crystal clear. Please get a grip and please start putting people before paperwork. Thank you, sir. Kevin Foster. Well, thank you, Mr Gray. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and I thank the Honourable Member for Newcastle upon Tyne North for opening this debate and colleagues for their insightful contributions on what is a vitally important issue. Although, you know, given some of the comments we had in the debate about attendance, I do note the clash with the statement in the Chamber meant people who may well have wished to participate in this debate instead decided to attend that in instead, given many some of the points being raised were obviously literally being answered in the Chamber as we were sat here deliberating on this particular petition. Now, in starting, Putin's war on Ukraine is monstrous and unjustified. And this country stands shoulder to soldier with the brave Ukrainian people against his unprovoked aggression. We have stepped up with our response, including giving Ukraine the means not only to defend itself, but ultimately to drive the invader from their lands. Now, a number of points were raised during the debate, which I'll perhaps briefly cover and go through. And a number of colleagues asked about passports. And one of the reasons why we moved to the idea of the biometric route, well, the route without biometrics based on passports, was looking at the analysis of those who had presented themselves wanting to apply. And in something like the first 2,000 people who presented themselves, only less than 100 didn't have a valid Ukrainian passport. And to be clear, it's a valid Ukrainian passport. We're not detailing between the type of Ukrainian passport. For those familiar with their passport, they issued a new type, slightly issued a new type of passport seven years ago, provided it's valid. So the vast majority have brought their passport with them. In terms of whether we're offering paid priority services, I think we'd all agree that that would be, frankly, immoral in the family scheme to offer a paid priority service. And I can certainly say to colleagues here today that we're looking to suspend across UKBI our super priority and priority visa services. Uh, we will still prioritise people in the wider system who have um, compelling and compassionate circumstances. So, for example, someone seeking to travel to the UK for a funeral or someone who perhaps she needs to urgently take up a role in the NHS. Uh, but we will be looking to suspend the general priority service to, again, free up UK VI resource because uh, I think we'd all realise that it's actually right that at this time as many of our decision makers as possible are prioritised to this particular route rather than our normal type of uh, priority uh, visa services. And certainly people should not be being charged at a VAC when they are looking to make applications in, into, this, into this route. So certainly that is something that we're clear. Also suspending the wider priority visa services clears up any confusion people apply, acquire about the wider migration system whilst at that particular, uh, visa, uh, particular visa application centre. In terms of safeguarding, I hope colleagues will appreciate why it wouldn't be particularly sensible to go into the exact details of what safeguarding checks uh, will be done on those offering to sponsor people coming 
uh, to the UK. But yes, there will be safeguarding checks uh, performed. And you know, again, that's of course similarly of course, with the devolved administrations as well in terms of as you say, those offering for sponsors. But I think a lot of us would understand why if I start reading out the list of exactly what we're going to do and what we're going to check, that wouldn't necessarily be the most sensible thing for me to do. But yes, where people offer to be a sponsor, we will, there will be safeguarding checks in place because even if they're sponsoring adults, we're conscious that many of them will be vulnerable individuals, aside to whether it's vulnerable of adult and a, and a child. Very briefly. Um, Thank you. Uh, Mr. As well as asking for that, I was asking about the people who are then placed with a family or with somebody who's got a spare room and how, how we ensure that they have the, the knowledge that enables them to reach out for help, the means to reach out for help and the confidence to do it. Because if you think about it, somebody is taken in by somebody, they're going to be extremely grateful because they're no longer having bombs raining down on them, but they may feel uncomfortable, something may go wrong and they may not want to report it. So what do we do to ensure that people in that situation primarily women and girls, are able to do that? Yeah. Women and yeah. children. Um, it's, it's, it's good points uh, that, that, are be, that are being made. One, obviously, there's some funding being offered up to local communities, and I've taken board the point around that the member Strangford made about the slightly different structure in Northern Ireland, as we had with, for example, the National Transfer Scheme for Unaccompanied Children, where there's a slightly different process in Northern Ireland reflecting uh, the devolved structure and how it's dealt with in that, in, in, within Northern Ireland. We are providing funding uh, to local Count to local councils, They're certainly the package, and I appreciate that obviously being in this debate meant couldn't be in the, wide, in, the widest, in the widest statement, but certainly that is something we're working with. And, you know, and I think it's safe to say myself and the Scottish Government haven't always got on particularly well at, at, ta at times. I think that's probably safe to say. But I do welcome, on a serious note, the genuinely constructive offers. I've briefly had conversations with Neil Gray, who's, who's taken on a seat in trying to coordinate in terms of the way Richard Harrington is, Lord Harrington, I should say, for the, for the UK government, his, his role for the Scottish government, about what work they can do around, again, the points. Because what we don't want is, you know, as every colleague has made the point here, you know, speed is becoming essential, getting people in is becoming essential. How can we do that? And, you know, I look at my own community that hasn't got the experience, for example, Glasgow has around uh, welcoming, you know, communities of those seeking asylum, those seeking refuge that this doesn't become a delaying factor across large parts of, large parts of the UK and that those balances need, need, do need to be struck. As I say, there, is a fu there are funding packages to try and create that spot and also recognise there's some wider debates around how well we can ensure, we can ensure that support is, is provided there. But that's conscious that's where colleagues in, in DLUC will be working very, very closely on. I'll come to the member for Hamsford and then I'll do the member for Stratford. Uh, on, on that point, is the minister saying that if families do manage to get reach the UK and don't have immediate offers of accommodation, which is also happening. I, I gave the example earlier of a family who could accommodate, but there are equally families, perhaps in overcrowded social housing, who will get relatives over here and won't be able to. Where should they go? Is he saying they should go to the local authority? The local authority will say, yes, we've got funding from the government, or is there some other solution? Yeah, I think slightly different position for those who are in the UK already. And I just want to reassure, given his... I think point that was a bit strange, you know, they're fearful of being asked to leave. There is no prospect of removals being done to, to Ukraine. Um, I'm not going to put a time frame on that because we clearly can't put a time frame on that. But at this moment, any removals action has been suspended. Uh, we clearly, and that includes our voluntary returns, because again, that would clearly be quite a bizarre thing to be encouraging at, at the moment. So there is no prospect of someone from Ukraine who's, or I'm say, ordinarily resident in Ukraine, because there's a, there is a slight difference just with Ukraine, Ukrainian nationals point on that point. There is no prospect of people being asked to return. We've already automatically extended a number of visas for those here with temporary status. Uh, obviously, if people are already here with status as a skilled worker or as a student, and there is no need for them at this stage to apply for anything. And of course, we are, if people have their their status is due to expire, then they can certainly get in, get in contact. And we're certainly, you know, there is no intention that people need to leave, will need to leave, need to leave this country. And in reality, there is no practical returns route anyway, anyway if, even if that was a case. But to be very clear, those who are here, Ukrainian nationals, lawfully do not need to leave. And we will make further announcements, confirmations over the next few weeks about the position looking ahead. But I think most of us would accept that the priority at this stage uh, needs to be those who are either in Ukraine, 
looking to make preparations that if they need to leave, particularly we're aware there are large numbers of people in Western Ukraine who, again, depending on what happens in the coming weeks for the military campaign, may then move into, may then move into uh, Poland and into uh, Slovakia or Hungary if Russian forces come closer. Of course, we hope that that doesn't happen. We see the defence being mounted of Kyiv, and we're very com and think we can be confident that Ukraine is, put, is halting what was a Russian advance in that direction. But, as I say, for those here in, here in the UK, as I say, people don't need to apply for different statuses, and later this year we'll confirm things like positions around future entitlement to settlement and other areas. But I think we'd all accept that at the moment probably there's very few Ukrainians arriving, particularly focused on a potential ILR application in, 20, in 2027. So in terms of going through some of the other... Oh, sorry, I'll take this round. Sorry, Jim apologies. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his very constructive and positive uh, response to, to us all, and, and, and we look forward. Minister, I had asked the, the question of the £350 per week uh, and the £10,000 and the different system, and you referred to that, Minister, yeah. in, in your response, just so we can understand. I mean, I'm quite happy if you want to write to me and let me know about that and, and, and give us the, 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 uh, how the system will work, but also to say, in my contribution, I referred to, in my constituency, just as one example, we have 100 families here willing to give accommodation. We have 100 job vacancies in one company available at this moment in time. Time is of the essence. How can we do that with, with the help of the Minister? Thank you. Uh, thank, well, I thank the Honourable Member for Strangford for his constructive uh, comments, as always. And I say a lot of that will be around the sponsorship, around the sponsorship route. Uh, the £350, my understanding is that will be to the sponsor, the person providing uh, accommodation. I do take on board the points he makes about the payment that would go to local authorities is a very different context in Northern Ireland, given uh, the slightly different responsibilities around things like children's services, as we recognise in the NTS. But I think it's probably better one that's set out in writing, set out in more, more response in writing to set out the detail of exactly how that will break down. Now, one or two of the other queries people, people specifically raised is the issue of those who've already applied for visas and if they get a grant letter but haven't had the vignette put in their, pass, put in their documents or their passport, which is normally the request to go back to the VAC. Uh, that, as of tomorrow, if they've got the letter granting, that will be enough to, to travel to the UK with a carrier in the same way as the permission to travel letter system that we will establish and open from tomorrow. Again, looking to minimise the number of people who have to make appointments at VACs and go and collect particular forms of documentation. Oh, Briefly, go ahead. Can I just confirm, for, for people who have got an appointment booked but don't yet have a form, from tomorrow are they able to travel to the UK without that form? For people who have had their appointment and they have applied and filled in everything but they're still waiting for the form to come back, can they also travel? There's two different types of people there. Okay, let's, let's go through. Those who haven't yet submitted their biometrics have two options from tomorrow. The first is either to make a separate application for permission to travel under the new system, and then when they get, it'll be a PDF emailed form, because some people have taken the view, is the letter being posted? No, it'll be emailed to them. And that can be shown, by the way, or it can be printed out by a friend colleague. Uh, similarly, it can also, it doesn't need to be individual smartphones for individual. If one family's got one phone, they can, sh you know, they can show multiple forms on it. So again, to again reassure people, we're not going to expect everyone to have a phone with it, on, with it on. So from tomorrow, if you've already submitted your biometrics and you get a letter that says, yes, you've got your, vi you've got your visa, the decision letter, normally you'd go back under a normal visa process to collect the vignette in your passport to then allow you to travel. As of tomorrow, my firm understanding, is you can show that letter saying, yes, I've got a decision with your passport and you'll be able to travel to the UK, rather than going back to the VAC to collect your vignette. If you, though, haven't yet got done your biometrics, you can instead apply through the permission to travel scheme, the new scheme we're launching tomorrow, and again, if you get the permission through that, again, proceed to the UK, to proceed to the UK and sort out your biometrics with up to six months after arrival. We won't be, for example, taking biometrics at, at the border, again, because of looking at facilitating travel into the, into the UK. So, that, so once people have got a decision letter uh, that with their passport, they'd be able, they'd be able to travel. Obviously, if people haven't got passport, a valid Ukrainian passport, then it is still the process of needing to be documented. In many cases, if people haven't got any documents, 
but they obviously also need to obviously get a document that actually allows them to board, it, board an aircraft regardless of their destination, particularly if they're looking to travel from Eastern Europe rather than end up on a relatively grueling land, land journey. So that probably covers some of the points. And people have made comparisons to the Afghan system and, you know, lessons are being learned. You know, we, a lot of people are still in hotels. We had a great effort to get people out of Kabul, but I think it's safe to say, to put simply, the offers have not come forward from communities across the UK for rehousing. Re so there's certainly one, there's a challenge there. And I was struck by the uh, member for York that all must take part. And, you know, I do look at the fact that we see communities such as Glasgow that always step up, that are our biggest dispersal area, step up in every refugee resettlement situation, stepped up for Afghans, stepped up for Syrians, and I'm sure, well, again, the community there will be stepping up in this context. And then I look, sadly, at many other, briefly, briefly in a moment, in a moment. Um, I then look at other parts of, you know, perhaps a tale of two cities, where not that far away, given some of the comments we heard, Edinburgh doesn't take part in the dispersal area system for asylum seekers. So again, that's, what, that's certainly one which, you know, I, I'm quite struck regularly by the arguments that people all must take part, and certainly that's another item that we will certainly be looking at very, very closely. I agree to take from my Labour shadow first, and then I'll come back to the essence. I thank the Minister for giving way just on this point about who is stepping up. Um, I'm sure he'll be aware that, uh, based on the current figures, councils that are led by Labour are taking between six and seven more time, times more refugees than councils that are currently led by the Conservative Party? Well, I'm very keen to encourage all to take part. I think there's only five councils that aren't take, that haven't offered, in principle, to take part in the Afghan uh, resettlement scheme. He'll note what we recently did with the national transfer scheme, where now every council in the UK, and respect to the Northern Ireland site difference, the, uh, it's done on a Northern Ireland basis there, is now mandated to take part in that particular process around unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. And, of course, he'll note that with some of the references I've perhaps just made to dispersed accommodation uh, in relation to asylum seekers, I, you know, I am struck by the fact there's communities that step up every, sing every single time. You know, to a place like Stoke and Trent, which are, conser are conservative-led uh, councils. And then other areas which, are, you know, I hear a lot of demands that, people should be doing things for asylum seekers, yet when we approach about becoming a dispersal area, it seems strangely quiet. So I'll take from my sister, Ms. Shadow. COSLA is the uh, convention of Scottish local authorities, and COSLA has told the minister and his colleagues, and I have told the minister and his colleagues, that in addition to every one of the 32 Scottish local authorities taking in refugees in the Syrian resettlement scheme, they would be happy if it were appropriate in terms of the wraparound services, they would be happy to take part in the asylum dispersal scheme if there was any support. But the problem is that this government expects the councils to carry all the costs associated with it. So there is no excuse if he's going to start supporting them, then they will start chipping in with that as well, as well as refugees. Well, again, I, what I find interesting, though, is I regularly hear how it's moral duties and people should be taking part and then I have to do contrast that the situation is alluded to in Scotland is that 31 out of 32 are not are not dispersed areas, including the city including the city of Edinburgh because the only place in Ed, the only place in Scotland that's a dispersal area is the city of Glasgow that said though we are engaging with lo we are engaging we are we will take in a moment and here we the only, the only dispersal area in Scotland is Glasgow, so I'd certainly be happy to confirm that to the member for Edinburgh South West. However, we have taken on board the representations from local government and we are engaging with local councils about how we alter the, fun, the, fun, the funding system. But still, it's a fair point. There's plenty of communities across this country that have made huge efforts to support the current dispersal system and, other, and others that have refused. And with that, I'll give way to the member for Edinburgh. Um, I'm not the member for Edinburgh, I'm the member for Edinburgh South West. It's quite a big city with several MPs. Um, the Home Office's own figures on Section 95 asylum support show that thanks to the efforts of Glasgow City Council, the percentage located in Scotland under that scheme is more than Scotland's population share and higher than any council in the United Kingdom. So we're taking more per capita in Scotland than our population share. 
And also in relation to Edinburgh, we do care to apologise to Edinburgh City Council, which has one of the most successful and generous contributions towards resettlement of refugees, with which I've worked with uh, them on that very closely. So he's made his point about asylum. Would you like to acknowledge Edinburgh's uh, world-renowned contribution to the resettlement of refugees? Thank you. Well, um, again, she's highlighted how well Glasgow is doing. I, I, earlier in my speech, I cited how Glasgow steps up every time. But the fact is still absolutely the same. Edinburgh is not a dispersal area. 31 out of 32 areas are not dispersal areas. That's a straight, that's a straight fact. I'll happily give way, but it's a fact of fact. I asked him about asylum. I asked him about resettlement of refugees. I'm sure the minister must understand that there's a difference. So he's had his wee go at Edinburgh about asylum. Now I'm asking him, in fairness, to recognise Edinburgh City Council's sterling contribution towards the resettlement of refugees. As he knows, Scotland has taken more per capita of Syrian refugees than anywhere else in the United Kingdom, and that's largely due to Edinburgh. Now, will he have the generosity to acknowledge that? Happy to acknowledge all the generosity that there's been across Scotland in terms of the resettlement schemes, but the point still stands, and it's rather odd to say we do, there's a lot being done in, on dispersal accommodation in Scotland, because that's great because there's one council down the road, yet where I represent doesn't, doesn't need to take part in that. So I would say we will be looking to reform it, but I think it's perfectly fair to again point out, and there are plenty of communities across the United Kingdom who step up for refugees and are part of our dispersal accommodation system. No matter how many people, no matter how those who say no try and argue it. Go ahead. The Minister with a different point. Yeah. Um, could he tell the House, in relation to the Syrian scheme, which he's quoted very usefully, and the um, Afghanistan two schemes, and now I think two, at least two schemes for the Ukrainian um, conflict, could he tell us broadly, just off his own head, does he think that um, we're sort of where are we at in terms of the Afghanistan scheme? Obviously, we don't know how many more applicants there will be because Ukraine is currently 18 days into the most dreadful war. We, broadly speaking, we think we know what happened with Syria, but with Afghanistan, could you tell us that? Yeah, I just appreciate the situation in Afghanistan presents some unique difficulties. Of course, we can't. I see people indicate I will come, but I'll deal with this intervention, intervention first. You know, we still are able to get... We are still helping people get out of Afghanistan. I hope you should appreciate why it wouldn't be sensible for me to go into some of the routes and methods they use to uh, exit Afghanistan at this time. Uh, but certainly we are, we've made strong progress. I think there is a challenge now, and certainly my colleague, Minister Harrington, will now take on about now how we can move people on from hotels. As I say, it's one of the points we've learned with this scheme is about trying to pair up the accommodation, give more people an opportunity to take part in a way I must say, with a cohort with Afghanistan, it's slightly more difficult given they're mostly larger families who we brought out, rather in this instance where it's mostly single women, women with children, given the nature of, of course, men being required by Ukrainian law between 18 and 60 to stay and fight. Member Strangford, then the next one, and then I think I will start actually making some progress on my speech. Minister, can I thank you for the, the Afghan scheme? And we in Northern Ireland have been very much actively and responded to that. For instance, in, in, in uh, my neighbouring constituency of North Down, which has become the, the central point for, location, for bringing people from Afghanistan, people have been in the Marine Court for seven months. Uh, we were very keen and very anxious to get those people out to the jobs and accommodation, which we spoke about in the past. Just ask the Minister, can you give us some update when you hope, as Minister, to see those people filtering out into the constituency? Thank you. Yeah, I think in terms of uh, Ukraine only, you know, we hope to set things forward very quickly and you'll be aware of the statement made by my right honourable friend in the House earlier. But look, I think in terms of, I'm conscious of time, conscious votes are due again. You know, given the petitions call, you know, I do want to be clear at the outset that as stated by the Prime Minister and Home Secretary, we do not believe a blanket visa waiver is the right forward, a position which appears to have been endorsed uh, by the opposition, given their call for visas rather than wa waivers with biometric checks included. Normally, security and biometric checks are a fundamental part of our visa process in order to keep people in this country safe, ensuring we can identify those entering our country, and this is consistent with our approach to the evacuation of Afghanistan. And whilst it's easy to dismiss, it is vital to keep both British citizens safe, but also to ensure we are helping those in genuine need. And we are sadly already seeing people presenting false documents claiming to be Ukrainian, 
uh, seeking to enter the UK, including some border, for, some border force of subsequent identifiers being of other nationalities having no links uh, to Ukraine. This should not detract from our work creating safe and legal routes for Ukrainian nationals to come to the UK. And I think I promise to give way to the member of the Commission. Thank you. I wanted to congratulate the Minister on dancing on the head of a pin uh, so well. But could I also point out to him that my own area, North Lanarkshire, has taken refugees from the DRC, from Syria, and is taking refugees from Afghanistan. And we have a long history of taking refugees without UK government intervention, going right back to 1919. Again, and we look forward then to the area signing up to be a dispersal area as well, which I'll be very pleased to take forward. So doing this through a visa process means processing can be controlled and vital security checks carried out, including ensuring people coming are actually Ukrainian, meet our eligibility criteria and do not present a risk. We've announced, I must have given away quite a lot, and I think I now need to make some progress. We've announced our bespoke Ukrainian family scheme, the scheme significantly expands the ability of British nationals and people settled in the UK and others to bring family members to the UK, extending eligibility to adult parents, grandparents, children over 18, siblings, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, cousins and in-laws and all of their immediate family members. We have ensured the scheme is it's easily accessible, is fee-free and does not include any salary or language requirements. We do recognise, though, and again the comments made today, that we need to speed things up. Therefore, to further support the Ukrainian people, as announced by the Home Secretary last week, from tomorrow, holders of Ukrainian passports who are outside of the UK will no longer be required to provide their biometric information when making applications under the Ukraine scheme, family scheme. Once applications have been processed, individuals will receive a permission letter sent electronically, enabling them to travel to the UK and will also not be required to collect a vignette in their passport. They can either print this or show it on any smart device. This can include, can include a family member's smartphone or device if they do not have one of their own. Those granted status under the scheme will be able to come to the UK for three years, the right to work and access to benefits. Applicants who hold identity cards and do not have a valid passport will still need to attend a VAC in person and provide their biometric information, but this new system means our VAC capacity can focus on those who need it. The Prime Minister has also announced plans for a new scheme to introduce a new sponsored route for Ukrainians with no ties to, come to, to the UK to come here, with more details having been announced in the Chamber this afternoon. And this scheme is completely uncapped. And for help colleagues, there's also a frequently asked questions section that's just gone live on Gov.uk. I'll briefly give way. I'm really grateful to the Minister giving way. Could he say how long it is going to take for a family with no family connection in the UK coming through the Homes for Ukraine scheme to actually be placed Order. with a family here? Order. Order.
I'll look at it. Do a recall. The sitting is resumed and the Minister was on his feet when we were interrupted. Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Gray. And I haven't forgotten the intervention that I've had an unusually long time to uh, think about so compared to uh, normal. In terms of the timescale, obviously from today, individuals and organisations can register their interest in becoming a sponsor. An application is welcome for individual sponsors and named beneficiaries from, from Friday. You know, we aim to expedite decisions quickly. We want to get through as many. Again, some of that will depend on how, you know, how many we have come, we come, come forward, but certainly we're keen that in the very, very quickly after Friday, the first people are able to arrive under the sponsorship scheme. And as we say, we will, there will be safeguarding checks, there will be checks on the individuals, but the, the approach will be around, make, around making sure we can expedite decision making as much as possible. And I reassure you, know, we'll also be working with the devolved administrations and others where appropriate in terms of the type of checks, again, where we can with a view to the speed. And, you know, I do want to make a point that there is no limit on the sponsorship scheme. There is no set amount. You know, we think of other schemes where we've set a particular ceiling or quota. There is no limit. The only limit will be the offers that come forward. And you know, this, to make this scheme a succession, it will require the whole of society to come forward and show our heartfelt concern and solidarity. Let's be honest, as we did as a society 80 years ago, when many communities across this nation welcomed evacuees from the industrial cities and potential landing grounds for an armed invasion of this country, many of whom formed lifelong friendships after, after, afterwards. So, you know, this is a country that has a history of being generous, and this scheme will facilitate them doing that. And, you know, we do want the wider diaspora in the UK. And, you know, I take on board the points people have made that ultimately the goal is not to evacuate Ukrainians from Ukraine to serve Vladimir Putin's purpose. The ultimate goal in the long run is to make sure that people who have had sanctuary here and in other European countries can in the end return to a free and democratic Ukraine with the invaders driven from their country. So that is our ultimate goal. But we will make sure that people are able to come and able to take advantage of the generous offers that people are making. So, Mr. Gray, you know, we are in unique times. We have brought forward two major schemes at, rap at rapid speed. We recognise colleagues and want us to go faster, and we will. Literally, as I'm speaking, more visas are being granted, and from tomorrow, permissions to travel via the new simplified procedure. You know, we do believe this is a country that wants to stand beside the people of Ukraine, wants to demonstrate this solidarity by making offers to provide housing and to which we welcoming people into their home. And we can all contrast this generosity, this solidarity, with the vicious campaign that Russia has unleashed on innocent civilians, bombing maternity hospitals, shelling residential areas, a type of barbarity that we hoped we had seen the end of in Europe 80 years ago and which our grandparents fought to end at that time and made such sacrifices. And what I think, Mr Gray, is so sad is we think of the sacrifice that the Soviet people made to defeat Adolf Hitler. Over 20 million Soviet citizens lost their lives in that, context, in that conflict. And now today to see what is being done in the Russian people's name by their own government is, is absolutely tragic. But the hope we can take from 80 years ago is that then despots and dictators who thought they could conquer Europe soon found themselves 
in the annals of history, having been defeated by free and democratic peoples who united to defeat them. That is what we are doing against Putin's Russia, and soon that will be the victory that will be secured by the Ukrainian people. Catherine Kinnell. Thank you, Mr Gray. And I thank the Minister for his response, because it feels like we're finally getting on the same page both across this house and where the British public are in terms of the response we want to see from us as a country, but that we rely on the government to deliver. The question is, we have a division, and rather than come back again, if I may, can I put the question, would that be agreeable? I'm very sorry to the Honourable Lady, if she doesn't mind. Uh, the question is, this house considered the e-petition 609530 relating to arrangements for Ukrainian refugees to enter the UK. Is there anything to say aye? aye. Contrary, no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it, order, order. And I apologise again to the Honourable Lady. Division of the Main Chamber. The proceeding has ended.